I'll call the uh, Finance and Law Subcommittee to order. Mr. Fiore. Present. Mr. Souza. Present. <clears throat> Student activity accounts, we have none this evening. Uh, we have some cafeteria bids to open for school milk and for paper products. So we'll do school milk first. We have one bid for the school milk, and it is New England ice cream from Norton, Massachusetts. And I'm sorry, we do have a second one as well. They didn't have a name on the, um, on the envelope, but we will know who it is when we open the bid. That I know. <laughs> and the second bid is from Cape Dairy, also known um, as White Brothers. Thank you. And um, New England ice cream sent to communication. At this time, New England ice cream for the upcoming school year 2021-2022, unfortunately, will not be able to participate in the bid process for Taunton School's milk due to changes in our business model and distribution footprint from COVID-19. We are interested in working together in the future. Please keep us on the bid list to, refuse, to receive future bids for milk, dairy, and ice cream as our distribution footprint may evolve at this time next year. It's signed by Kim Imbernone, their Vice President of Sales and Service. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. How about White Brothers? Madam uh, yeah. Sister Superintendent, I have, and Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, good bid here <coughs> um, from Cape Dairy, Doing business as Cape Dairy. Oh, doing business as White Brothers Dairy. I'm sorry, Osterville. Cape, Cape Dairy. Cape, yeah, Cape Dairy. And there's a, there's a hundred dollar cashier's check here, <coughs> treasurer's check. So that looks like a good bid. Move we refer the bids any communications to the administration for review and recommendations. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. And paper products. <clears throat> we have two bids that came about. One was from Mansfield Paper in West Springfield, Massachusetts, and W.B. Mason out of Brockton, Massachusetts. And again, this is for paper. <clears throat> Mansfield paper is a good bid. W.B. Mason is a good bid. All the proper signatures and they have a <coughs> bid bond. 
similar motion, Mr. Rasuza. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'll move that uh, we refer the paper products bid openings to administration for review and recommendation. Second. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. All right, moving on. We have bills payable in the amount of $2,220,251.77. Mr. Souza. Uh, thank you, Chairman Martin. Ms. Moynihan, how are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Excellent. Good, thank you. I just have two, uh, maybe, maybe three questions. Uh, page <laughs> three, down at the bottom, Dell Finance and Dell Marketing. <laughs> I had that one. So the first one on Dell Financial, this is um, because we had originally had a lease on our Chromebooks from prior years, we ended up paying off the lease ahead of time, so we will not have any um, liability going forward in that, in that purchase. So that is the early buyout from the Chromebooks. Gotcha. And then the next <coughs> one is um, purchasing of additional Chromebooks. Chromebook um, licenses, which is called Google, it's their Google um, license, and so that is all of it from uh, um, again 3,200 Chromebooks that were purchased. So, um, and they are. And just so I could, I just want to say that we are re the reason why we're purchasing the 3,200 Chromebooks. It is because of the specific Chromebooks that we have currently that are at end of life. So those Chromebooks can't be used and can't be updated. I mean, they can be used, but very minor, as they will not be uh, supported by Google. No, that's important. Thank you. Uh, and I see the uh, bottom half of that's coming from a from a grant. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, well. Will we be <coughs> uh, using those disposable Chromebooks as a, what do I Do want to say? Uh, door stops? No. We don't want to call them disposable ones, but we are going to be using parts. Those are, uh, we'll be taking those that aren't going to be able to be used. We'll be bringing them into the technology area where they will take them apart and use parts into repairing the other Chromebooks. So we're not going to declare them as surplus? No, we're not. That's what I was trying to say. Mr. Chairman, I have one more question. Yes, Mr. Sousa, go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Ma Mr. Chairman. I have uh, page 13, <coughs> which is, I think, United Restaurant. Let me see if I remember right. Yes, United Restaurant for 14000 So this is for um, um, the Rachel Ray Award donation that we received, um, and that is uh, to spend on for the Family Consumer Sciences Kitchen the upgrade, at the high school. The upgrade, yeah. Right, exactly. It's just a pass through. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, don't. Ha I have no further questions. I have no questions. No questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll remove that we pay the warrant bills payable in the amount of for FY21 in the amount of two million two hundred twenty thousand two hundred fifty one dollars and seventy seven cents as presented. Motion has made and I'll second it. Seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. All right. Facilities update, Brenda? Just a very quick one. We are, of course, as you know, this is the end of the school year where we are finishing up and putting away items and getting them ready for the summer, for summer cleaning and all by our custodians. Also at the Mulcahy um, Elementary School, they are currently putting together the um, the smaller playground, and I believe it should be done within the next two weeks, as we had a Mulcahy Building Committee meeting this morning. So um, the school is looking great as we're putting additional signage around the building, and um, and we're getting ready for the end of the school year. I had, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Susan. I had an opportunity on um, Sunday to take my 88-year-old father over there to see the outside of the building and see the playground in the back and <coughs> the left side for the kids in the parking lot and and uh, he can't walk around it but I took my vehicle and I was able to show him around and uh, he was uh, ecstatic that I was able to I just want to tell you that that's a really a, a great looking place as we found out this morning um, and this is still coming about too is that um, the MSBA is looking to see as possibly having Mulcahy as a model school so that other pro other school districts that are looking to uh, build a school that they can go ahead and look at Mulcahy as being the model of building so that is a, a, a great cool. it was it's great with our design team and our OPM I mean it's been a great process to see and so yeah Yes, it is a beautiful school. Can I congratulate the administration and the school committee and, and, and uh, the building committee because 
that is um, that was a great team effort, and uh, we we have a great product that result of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield. Any further discussion under facilities update? And I'm sorry, I should have said, we are beginning the alternative high school window project beginning next week as the school ends. And our windows will, and again, that is an MSBA project as well, the accelerated repair project. <coughs> and that will begin at, I believe it's Thursday, right after school is, last day is Wednesday. Motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion made second, and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. <clears throat> Call the June 16th meeting of the Taunton School Committee to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the National Anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Spangled then I yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Mrs. Fagan, the roll call in the prayer, please. Okay. Lord, as we begin this session, let us acknowledge your goodness and mercy and ask your blessings on all our deliberations. We thank you for this opportunity to be of service to the community and to the young people entrusted to our care. <coughs> Ms. Doherty? Present. Mr. Pulowski? Present. Mr. Fiore? Present. Mrs. Fagan's present. Uh, Mr. Martin? Present. Mrs. Almeida? Mr. DeMello? Present. And Mr. Souza? Present. Oh, Mayor O'Connell. Th thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Uh, Administrative Business um, uh, Approval of Minutes, June 2nd, 2021. Second. Motion made and second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Student Council Representative Report. We have Aislinn Campbell. Come on up, Aislinn. Make sure the green light's on. <coughs> Good evening, members of the school committee. Today, the senior prom will take place outside at Gillette Stadium. The school year is coming to a close with final exams this coming Monday and Tuesday. Students are working hard to finish the school year strong. The boys volleyball team and girls lacrosse team had, their, had successful senior nights this week, along with tennis and all the other spring sports. The seniors also had a successful senior yearbook signing event at Star Drive-In along with a well-organized graduation ceremony on the football field. That will complete my report. Thank you. Thank you, Aislinn. Any questions of the committee? Second. Uh, a motion made and seconded to receive and place on file. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Aislinn. Have a great day. Next item on the agenda is public input, and I have the list here. There is no public input. Next item on the agenda, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent. We have the Special Education Parents Advisory Council representative, and we have, um, and then we, we have another presentation of that uh, Healing Miles at American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Marathon in the month uh, in the Silver City. That's uh, Mrs. Hoy. So, uh, Superintendent Cabral. 
Well, thank you, Chairman Souza. So during my entry work about three years ago, there were many themes that were discussed when I met with constituents and stakeholders throughout the Taunton Public Schools. And one of the common themes that was discussed uh, was special education as well as the mental health of our students. So tonight we're gonna have two presentations. So the CPAC will be presenting first and they will be followed by Jen fusco Hoy, who will be presenting our Healing Miles and the AFSP Marathon in a month in the Silver City. So we'll begin with the CPAC, which will be followed by Mrs. Hoy. Welcome uh, CPAC members and um Heather? Thank you. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yeah. It looks lit, but I can't. If it's on, it's a hill turn it up over there. So that was the green lights on. Looks like it. Okay. You can turn it up. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Heather. I'm um, one of the co-chairs of the Taunton Special Ed Parent Advisory Council. We have um, two other members here tonight if they want to just introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Allison Rosa. I'm one of the other co-chairs. Hi, I'm Deanna Alexandra. I'm the executive board member. Thank you. So thanks for having us here tonight. Um, so what we've done is um, we haven't met with the school committee as a whole in a while. So we've um, summarized the things that we've done for the past couple years, the different um, events we've had, presentations for families. Um, and then we've summarized a lot of the work the school district has done with us to try to make some improvements in our outreach. And then also some areas that we've heard from families that they have concerns on that we're hoping um, we can discuss and have some teamwork to make things better for everyone. Um, so on our first slide here, um, we know everyone in this room knows what a CPAC is, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, we just quoted where the law states what our group is and what we do. And some quotes there straight from um, the law that we participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of special ed programs and we advise the school committee on matters that pertain to, to the education and safety of students with disabilities. Um, our group mostly consists of um, parents and other family members of special education students, but we do also sometimes have some teachers that step in or some parents of general education students, and we're always very grateful for the support of anyone who wants to join us. And then on the next slide, you can see what we've done for the past couple years to give you um, an update. So we've done our legal obligation of making sure that um, a basic rights presentation is done every school year and offered to all special education families. And then what we do is we go through and we think of the questions that families most often bring to us and the things that they most often um, are really confused about and that's kind of how we choose what types of workshops that we want to offer year to year um, we also look at the state's numbers on how many students of each disability are in our district and we use that to also pick our topics so that we're reaching the maximum number of families um, <clears throat> so last year in the spring as COVID came we did have a few things that were canceled um, but this year we were able to get off the ground in the fall um, with a lot of good virtual workshops. Um, to our surprise, um, we had great <clears throat> attendance at virtual workshops. Um, typically, we might get about 10 people in person. We had a few during this school year where we had about 30 people in attendance when you look at the count online. So that was really great. Um, I think it takes out the element of needing childcare um, or of it being bedtime and having young kids that need to go to sleep. Um, so in that way, the pandemic actually helped some of our families because they were able to get a lot more of the workshops. And that's it for that one. So when we say areas of concern, um, what we mean are here are some of the topics that we most often hear from families that they would like to see improvements on or things that they're asking us for resources about, thinking that maybe we know where it is in the district, but it really isn't here. Um, 
So that's what we mean by areas of concern. If there was ever anything that was very serious, we would certainly bring it straight to the district or ask families to bring it straight to the district. But these are just the things that we think are areas that we can improve upon. So we know that we're a fully inclusive district. We have kids in inclusion in every grade level. Um, but as far as inclusion in the life of school, not all families are feeling that they necessarily have that. Um, we're hoping to really expand upon social, physical, academic inclusive practices in our district. And some of the ideas that we have for that are when we have an extended school year program, bringing some access to typical peers to that element. Um, we're looking for after school opportunities that happen in our buildings to have more support for students. Um, and this doesn't mean that families have asked for it and been denied, but there's a lot of families sitting at home that say, oh gee, a one to 10 ratio or a two to 20 ratio, my child can't handle that. So they're not even asking. Um, and I think it's really our job to reach out to these families and not only let them know that one, you are definitely welcome and everyone is allowed, and two, if you do need supports, that the school district is gonna assist with that. Because um, we know that every school-sponsored program that we have, we do need to make sure that we're giving any necessary supports. Um, we would really like to see the district come up with a way to reach out to those families to make sure that they know this. Because um, like I said, if they're not asking for it because they're automatically dismissing the idea in their head, then we're really gonna have to come to them and tell them, no, you, you do belong in this program. Your kids do belong here with us. Um, and, and it's our job to really make sure that they know that because we wanna make sure that none of the kids are missing out because of a misconception or a thought that it wouldn't be supported. Um, we think it would be great to have more unified sports. Looking at a lot of other districts, there's a lot of different sports that they have. I, I believe that we have bowling. Um, that was what we had heard last year. And basketball, awesome, great. Um, and track too, ooh, and track, exciting. Um, there's a lot of other um, districts that have a very robust program and they have dozens of high schoolers um, that volunteer to participate. Um, and we think that that would really be something beneficial to bring here. Um, let's see. Um, we're very excited as a CPAC with all the social justice work that's been done. And we would just like to give a gentle reminder, please, that as work is being done on social justice and as we're gathering um, family members or students to become parts of advisory panels, to please make sure that we're not leaving out students or families with disabilities um, because they also have a lot of great input on that and we need to make sure that we're getting a viewpoint from all lenses. Um, social emotional development, right? That's something that everybody in this room understands the big concern about for this year. So we really want to highlight that our guidance counselors are so key in our schools. And I know at least at the elementary level, less at the upper levels, the elementary um, IEP meetings are chaired by the guidance counselors. So when you have annual meetings, when you have three-year evaluation meetings, when you have um, extra meetings because parents have concerns and they call a meeting, this is all time that guidance counselors are pulled away from working with students. So these are the times when they could be doing check-ins with students, group sessions, lunch bunches, um, implementing any SEL efforts that are coming to the classroom, being used for crisis management. Um, when they're in an IEP meeting, it, as it's a legal obligation that they need to be there for the parent to do the meeting, um, they're not able to do all the other things. So we're very excited if the team chair positions can come back into the budget. We know that they were um, approved initially and then COVID hit and then the funding all changed and um, we completely understand that. But in this time where the SEL of our students is so critical, we would really love to see guidance counselors available to spend more time with their students. Um, and then just lastly here, and we don't have any specific ideas for this, um, but we would like to put the bug in people's ears that you know we're up for some teamwork on how we can improve this. The latest available numbers from DESE in 2019 
for Taunton were that 66.7% of our IEP students earn diplomas versus the state rate of students with disabilities being 74%. And the overall graduation rate for Taunton Public Schools is 94.4%. So our special education students are lagging behind in graduation. And we know that there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Um, but we're willing to put our heads together to see what we can do to make improvements in the district, in programming, in offerings, um, to see what we can do to get our graduation rate up so our students have more opportunities when they leave us. And then we did meet recently with um, the subcommittee and we have some developments that have come out of that, some work that we have that's going forward. We thank the district for this. Um, we have been given some storage space at Friedman, including some cabinets, which is great because currently we have supplies and bins in people's uh, bedrooms and closets and attics and basements. So it will be great to have a storage space to put our things. Um, we've worked out how we're going to disseminate communication from CPAC to our district families. So CPAC will create flyers. We're going to send it to the special education department. And then they are going to send it out to school principals, put it on the virtual backpack. And then it can also be sent out by email. Um, CPAC also manages our own social media. So we'll be sure to post it in the ways that we always have. Um, and Taunton Public Schools will share it on their social media as well. Um, we have over 1,500 students with disabilities in our district, so we're just trying to get out information in as many different ways as possible to reach as many families. Uh, we're thankful that the district has made us very visible now on the Taunton Public Schools website. Um, it's right there on the main page, as well as we've looked, and um, it's under the Families Information tab, and it's always been on the Special Education page with a little link. Um, now it's also on some of the school pages as well. So if people log into the website and just go straight to their school for information, they can find it there as well. Um, other discussions that we had when we were at that meeting, um, and these aren't things we were <coughs> expecting a resolution for right now. These are just discussion points that we had, and we want to continue these discussions. Um, we're looking for a plan on how we can continuously notify families and make sure that it's down in writing somewhere so that it can't be missed, um, that all students are welcome to participate in all aspects of school life, including activities, the clubs, sports, after school care at all grade levels, um, and that accommodations can and should be used for their students without hassle. Sometimes families just kind of sit back, like I mentioned earlier, and don't even ask because they don't feel like it will be a good fit or if they don't want to be the person that has to ask for accommodations, they don't want to be seen as that difficult parent. Um, but none of that really benefits our students. So what we really need to do is just make sure that everyone is well aware that they're able to be a part of all aspects of school life. And we did mention to the superintendent, and I know he wrote it down, so I, I fully expect that this will come to fruition, um, that we're hoping for the district to highlight more successes of all types of learners in our media materials. Uh, we are very proud of our students who are scholars and who are amazing athletes and we love when we see that go across the newspaper pages um, and they come and speak at school committee meetings and on the website but can we also please look at the personal successes of students who whose success is different than that um, you know the student who made it all day through field day the student who just moved to inclusion and made it all day through the class and has new friends now um, there's all sorts of if you talk to teachers there's all sorts of small successes that can be celebrated that are just as valid as the successes of other students um, and that's really only going to help us promote the idea of inclusion because it's going to show that all successes are valid and equal and to be celebrated which will just show that all students should be equal and celebrated. Um, you know, to be out there and to be promoted can only help promote more equity within the district. And then just at the end, if anybody was interested later, we have our email and our Facebook page and our website. And we just love this little quote here that inclusion is not simply about physical proximity. It's about intentional planning for the success of all students. 
Anything else, ladies? Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for the presentation. Any questions? Ms. Doherty and Mr. DeMello. I knew there was something wrong with it. It's like, you know, as, as one of my colleagues likes to say, you wish I would stay unmuted, right? <laughs> At any rate, thank you very much. We have worked uh, together uh, in order to uh, bring your um, ideas uh, about promoting uh, CPAC and to raise the issues surrounding the full inclusion of our special needs kiddos uh, in the life of our school district. So I think that that's really, really important. And so I'm very pleased to, to be a part of bringing forward the, uh, the uh, thoughts and ideas that you have in order to be able to do that. It is a journey. Uh, some things will be put forward and they, they won't work. Uh, and other things will be forgotten and just bubble up to the surface as time goes on. The superintendent, director of special education as well, has made a commitment to address all of the issues that the school committee heard uh, in regard to your wants and, not your personal wants and needs, but the wants and needs of families and children uh, who are special needs children. So I just have a question about the virtual backpack. What is that, and are you able to, because it sort of connects with a plan on how to continually notify all families as a concern, um, are you, uh, who are you able to, not who specifically, but in what numbers are you able to reach people with the information that they need to know, and is that through the virtual backpack? Sure, I, the superintendent can probably explain the virtual backpack better than I can so one of the probably going back five six years ago we noticed that a lot of the flyers that we sent home with students would end up at the bottom of the backpack and parents would find them on June 30th when they were cleaning their child's backpack out at the end of the year so one of the things that we did uh, like many districts is we created the virtual backpack which all the flyers or all the information that would typically go home in the communication folders or in the backpacks is on a visible site on our website. So there's a backpack on our website, you click on the back backpack, and then all the flyers or any, all the information we would typically send home with students in person is available and accessible there throughout the year. So just a follow on question, how do we reach families who are not tuned into social media or for whom we don't have email addresses? I know that we don't have email addresses for all of our families or had have not had in the recent past and not everyone is connected into social media. I can't speak on behalf of the CPAC but I can speak on behalf of the school system. Uh, that would warrant a phone call or an in-person visit. Thank you Ms. Doherty. Mr. DeMello. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Heather and your committee thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, since my time on the board CPAC has always been one of those uh, subject areas that's been, uh, how should I say it, uh, a learning experience for me, and I'm still learning. But uh, the only critique I have on the presentation, because I do like to critique sometimes, and when I see something that sticks out, it sticks with me through the whole presentation. You, you open up with areas of concerns and ideas for solutions, which is great, but you also come back with recent developments, and that recent developments doesn't give it that oof like we've accomplished this okay so because um, you always think of the negative and you don't think of the positive because we have come a long way as you know and my colleagues around the tables here will attest to that so it may be in the next presentation you just change that word to recent positive developments because we are coming a long way since my what uh, two and a half years or three three and a half years on this board so uh, thank you for that uh, regarding uh, something that you did bring up as far as the social emotional learning needs with the budget and so forth uh, if you've uh, probably listened we, we are working in multitude of fashions with budget workshops regarding the ARP and ESSER monies that uh, we have addressed uh, there's been some postings I saw today 
that are addressing those gaps uh, to fill in those needs for every student in the system. So I just wanted to point that out. If you haven't seen it, we have, as a committee, addressed it through the uh, 24 million, I believe, Mr. Superintendent, 17 plus seven, 24 million dollars that's coming into the school system. And last but not least, you mentioned uh, that there was a, a June CPAC elections virtual. Has that taken place yet? Yes, yep, we already did that. It was the first week of June. And do you have the, could you name who those members are? The commit, is it, is it the board? It is a new board. Okay. Um, and do they start next? They, they start right after the elections. So we, we have a new board in right. place right, right now. now. Okay. Yeah. So who, would, who's would you, president? How, how does, what's the composition of the board? I forget. I'm sorry. Sure. So we have, um, all positions have not been filled. We have up to three co-chairs, up to two co-secretaries, up to two co-treasurers, up to two public relations, and up to two executive board members that fill in as needed. But of the folks that have been elected, could you, could you name the president, was it vice president, secretary, treasurer, whatever? Sure. Help me out, guys. Um, I, I know that if I am one know, of the- I don't want to put you on the spot. That's okay. Right? I'm one of the co-chairs. you can and share Deanna, that with us. Deanna had said she's an executive board member. Co-chair. Co Allison is a co-chair. Uh, Lexi K is the other executive board member. Nancy Seamus is perhaps the secretary. Erica Trenton is, is treasurer. And Amy Siddiqui perhaps is the co-secretary. Those might not be exactly right. Okay, that's fine. Oh, and yep, and um, Alan Wendell is a public relations. Okay, okay, maybe you can send a list to us. Or we sure can. Through the yeah. administration, please. I'd appreciate it. Thank yep. you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You better keep her all around because she's got a great memory. <laughs> that's that's why I ask. They know. <laughs> uh, before Mr. Pulaski, Mr. Uh, Mr. Superintendent Cabral. Okay, uh, Mr. Pulaski. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Heather, Deanna, Allison, thank you guys so much for the uh, wonderful presentation, informative as always. Um, I, I was happy to see that we've gotten some level of progress from our meeting earlier with the uh, special projects subcommittee, um, but obviously there's still still a lot of work to be done. Um, so I want to make sure that you definitely get that list of all the heads of the PTOs because I, I think uh, you know, they're the ones planning all the events for all the schools. So I think your input to what they're doing is going to be invaluable to making sure that all these events are, you know, inclusive and welcoming for, for all of our children. Um, so let's make sure that keeps going. Um, and then uh, the one thing that stuck out to me, well, one of the things that stuck out to me from the presentation uh, was the graduation rate numbers. I found that kind of jarring. So uh, through you to uh, Superintendent Cabral, I don't know if we have uh, the data for 2020 and 2021 um, or if we have anything in place right now but this seems like uh, a pretty uh, a good goal for the district to see what what um, what initiatives we can put in place as a goal to bring that number up because I think if the state's number is in the 74 and our overall rate is in the 90s we can certainly do some work to bring that up over the next couple of years so that's a real easy number to look at and see in, in some level of progress. Um, so I wonder if that's something that we can, you know, collectively work on over the next, you know, months, years, what have you. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulaski. And I, and I think I'll just tag along that is though I think we should also identify if, the, if uh, what, what the issues are, you know, why that rate hasn't come up. It may be different from the state rate for some up from different reasons and we should, we need to identify the the root cause for us before we can figure out what how do we get it up but i think that'd be a great idea spoken like a true engineer mrs almeida well, my question would be on the graduation rate is it because some parents don't want their children to graduate with the class they want them to stay till the 22 22nd birthday and then they don't graduate or what it is because we um really put a lot of emphasis into making sure that all our children graduate on time. And I know that uh, we have had some students be able to walk across the stage and then come back to finish till their 22nd birthday. So what do you think it is? Uh, so being asked that question this evening and not having an opportunity to 
analyze the data. That is something that Mr. Barato and I can work on and present the school committee. I, we I won't do a thorough presentation, but we can provide you with a, with a report or a summary. I think some of it may be attributed to the fact that we do hold on to our special needs students until they age out. Mm -hmm. So that may uh, skew the numbers. But again, it all goes back to the work that we've been doing to address the achievement gap. So when we talk about the achievement gap for Hispanic students, special needs students, African American students, special education students do fall into that achievement gap and that is work that, that is ongoing that we will again be refocused on as we pass this pandemic. But I also want to point out that um, you know, the presentation was outstanding and I do believe that there are plenty of opportunities for growth. And I do believe the list that we went over when I met with you and the special education department, I think we've addressed all the areas, or at least we've finalized, or you got answers to most of them. Some were positive, some, uh, however, were negative. And I think we've addressed the list. But I, I would like to look at those numbers. Instead of looking at how Taunton compares to all 351 districts, I think it would probably be beneficial to see how we compare to like districts to have the number of special education students that we have, because we do exceed the state rate, I think the state rate is about 18, 16% for special needs students, we're at 20%. So we do exceed uh, the, special, the special education percentages. So I think long, long answer, short answer to a great question, we need some time to analyze that and provide you with some real time or some real information. Okay, so when do you think we have an answer for that, Mr. Cabral? Our next meeting is July 14th, so I think we could work and put a report together for July 14th when, uh, when we meet again. I'd appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, and, I, and I think going off that, again, that's a, that's a good point, is to make sure that uh, we're analyzing the right data, and that's the key. I have Mr. Fiore, then Mrs. Fagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of points. Uh, first of all, recently the uh, Director of Special Education announced that she's retiring this fall. That's one of the few positions that the school committee actually has a vote in, and while we haven't established the search process for succession yet, I do hope that uh, your organization has input for us because we're going we're to need to know from the consumer's point of view. Also, uh, with regard to your social media, Heather and her husband are both Facebook friends of mine, and I do get a lot of your postings. I'm not usually able to schedule going to some of your events, but I'm happy to see that they're occurring and happy to see that there's, there's outcome from them, and I'm grateful to all of you because I think you all know that my wife was a special needs teacher for a while. She's now uh, general ed, but they still send non-IEP students with issues to, to her class, so uh, we're still very attuned to the issues, and uh, the more input we have from you folks, the better. Thank you, Mr. Fiore. Mrs. Fagan. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. When I when I see things like um, <coughs> continually <coughs> notify all <coughs> families and, and have it well shown in writing that their students are welcome and able to participate in all aspects of school life, mm -hmm. do you think, do you, I get the sense that maybe you feel that they were excluded, but there seems to be so many places that we post all the activities in a school, like the, school, the student handbook. Doesn't all, isn't all that stuff in there about sports seasons and all that? Mr. Oh, do we still do student handbooks? Uh, well, my initial thoughts go back to uh, my time as a principal when we would have our incoming grade presentations. Right. And we would talk about all the opportunities, all the clubs, and all the activities. And um, I can just speak to my experience, so therefore I'm assuming it's still happening today. Mm -hmm. Maybe not during the last year and a half because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I do recall making presentations to parents stating that all students are welcome. And I can only speak to my experience at Freeman where um, if a child with disability um, needed, an, needed an educational assistant to be with them there in chorus, Mr. Martin, uh, when I would call his office, did fund it. Or we found the funds to make sure that there was somebody with them. Yeah. So it, it is difficult to, um, I guess the part that's difficult, to, to be frank, is uh, not knowing that families need that support, 
Uh, a lot of times the teacher in the classroom or the special educator in the classroom or the educational assistant, they would make us aware that students were going to be attending or participating in programs and then we would work as a school system or work as a school to make sure that there was support for that child if they needed support after school, whether it would be a nurse, whether it be an educational assistant, or whether we had to make special arrangements for transportation. So I do hear um, the concerns about <coughs> wanting to make sure that all families know that our buildings are inclusive and that our programs are inclusive, but um, it, it also is difficult to do that individual, that personal reach out, and a lot of it starts right in the classroom, uh, and that's how we get that yeah, information. I, I think um, a lot of times you get overwhelmed with stuff, particularly if you have more than one child in school, and I, God knows I, I know what that's like, and uh, I know sometimes things can get lost in the shuffle, but I've, I've always, I, I know that Mr. Ottavianelli has done a lot with that sports program, Unified Sports and stuff like that, and they keep, I'll tell you what, I've never seen anybody work as hard as that department to try to engage students, and I think they do an outstanding job, but I think, unfortunately, sometimes we just, as parents, have to go ripping through those backpacks because <laughs> you're right, there is stuff that gets crumpled on the bottom and, and gets lost, so I, I think it's a shared responsibility, but <coughs> I, I certainly, I don't, I don't have the feeling that anybody's really been excluded in all my years of seeing students in the schools. You know, I think a lot of teachers really do go out of their way. The after school things that you're looking for, it, I don't think we have daycare at all levels, right? We don't do anything at the high school with that, right? What does it stop, Mr. Cabral? Um, we, well, we run extended day. An extended day would run from pre-K through seven. In our okay. So, element, so it really stops when they go to eighth grade? Right? It does. Okay, is that satisfactory or did you want more than that? I, no, I, what you're saying is true. That's that's what I'm understanding. I just wanted to make sure. That yeah, I'm yeah. In, in the past, and we've spoken to the superintendent about this, um, in the past we've had um, students who have been disciplined for um, behaviors related to their disabilities or have been <coughs> excluded from after school care. Um, and I'm, I'm talking years ago at this point because since then the superintendent has said if we hear from a family that says that that has happened to reach out to him directly um, so that it can be addressed. But that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. There's families that are sitting at home saying, well, this is not going to work for me or my child's behavior. This isn't going to be a good fit. And we, we really want them to know, no, you don't have to sit at home. No, you don't have to be sitting crying, wondering where you're going to get your child care from. You're entitled to the same child care that everyone else is. And if it's not a good fit for your child, then we're going to try to accommodate them to see if we can make it work. Yeah, um, that's the hard part. Work for everybody. I mean, as hard as we try with that, we can't always make it work. But I, I think in all the years I've been here, both as a parent, a grandparent, and on this committee, I, I really do think we try really hard. But, you know, I like it brought to our attention. But I think, um, I don't know, maybe we should make sure all these things show up in the stuff. I don't know how you get the announcements home because a lot of kids know about trying out for sports because it's announced over the loudspeaker. So, um, you know, um, I, I, don't, I don't know how we get through with stuff like that. Unless we post stuff on on our uh, thing and then if you don't have the internet, you don't see it anyway. So, I, it's not easy. <laughs> sure, we, we understand that. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Okay, uh, thank you. This will be an ongoing uh, yes. conversation, it sounds like, between the CPAC and the Special Ed Department and then uh, the Superintendent. Mr. Cabral. Sorry, I just, again, I just want to talk about how I view this work as growth. You know, I don't think you'll ever hear me say anything is good enough. I believe we can always do things better. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is, we don't necessarily just break things for the sake of breaking things, but it's worth sometimes breaking something in order to make it better. So I think we can definitely continue to work, continue to grow uh, as a group. I just wanted to point out one correction, so I apologize. I'm not trying to be critical. But on the areas of concern and ideas for solution slide, the third bullet, uh, this school committee did approve six team chairs. So this, this group approved six team chairs that we're going to be funding through the American Rescue Plan or the ESSER funds. Uh, so, and I did learn that we actually did approve the job description for that. So I will be sharing that job description with this group as well as the minutes so everyone understands that we do have an approved job description that was approved by the school committee so we can post those six team chairs right away. Uh, that is something that we put into the budget three years ago. We had it in the budget through the Student Opportunity Act. Unfortunately, COVID occurred, so I am proud of this group 
but recognizing this need and allocating the resources to address that, because that's something that was very important to me, and I know to this committee <coughs> and to our school principals who have been advocating for that as well. So that was the only item I uh, wanted to point out, and again, it's, it's all about growth, and I look forward to working with this group and continuing to figure out ways we can support one another. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. You all set? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just uh, thinking about the graduation rate, <coughs> I might have missed some of the things, uh, Mr. Cabral, that you were talking about in terms of the analysis of that graduation rate, but it occurs to me that uh, there are youngsters who are in collaboratives, youngsters who are in other high schools where special programs exist, and wondering if in that analysis you would track whether or not those youngsters, for example, special program at Canton High School, is that youngster who graduates included in Canton High School's graduation numbers, or is that youngster who is a Taunton student included in Taunton's uh, graduation numbers as well? Uh, the second thing that I want to point out, and this came up some years ago, and I uh, look at uh, Mr. DeMello because uh, he is an employee at Bridgewater State University. There was a program, and may continues, it may continue to exist for uh, special needs children who are graduating from high school who qualify for entry into Bridgewater. Uh, we did not. We did not participate in that program. Have not participated in that program when it came up that many years ago. But if the program still exists, I think that it's well worth looking at uh, to see if, in fact, we might want to participate. There was a fee uh, that was attached to it, but I think that it would be worth exploring because I think there are youngsters who may qualify for participation. They could participate in our early college programs if they qualify to do that and are successful and could go on to a Bridgewater program or a community college program. So we might want to consider that as we develop programs going forward for our youngsters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dowdy. <coughs> Mrs. Almeida. Um, we did participate in that pro We did participate in that program. And I happen to know a student who graduated this year from that program who was a Taunton student. Yeah, I remember. And I remember many a times this gal, it took her 13 times before she passed the MCAS, okay? But she passed it and she's in, graduated this year from Bridgewater. She sent me a lovely, lovely note for helping her over the years. So we do participate in that program, Mrs. Doherty, just for your opinion. We should, yes. Thank you. The administration will look into that, I'm sure. Mr. Martin. As of uh, February 2020, the program did exist. Last time we were in person at the college, because I used to see the youngsters with their one-on-one uh, -on -one tutor, so to speak, uh, over in Burnell. And, uh, and there, were, there were quite a few of them. But uh, I'm sure with COVID, everything went south because we went remote. And uh, we're back in person in the fall, so hopefully we will continue to see that. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Colleagues, all set. Thank you, Heather and group. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate it. Mr. Cabral. Thank you. So the second presentation this evening, again, going back to my entry work, mental health was a topic of, con of great concern and when that was brought to my attention and is well embedded in our strategic plan. And um, I look forward in the near future to sharing the work that we've been doing as a school system, participating in the Sandy Hook Promise program. But tonight, uh, we won't talk about Sandy Hook and the program taking place in our school system. Tonight, we're gonna learn from uh, Ms. Hoy, who uh, I'd like to welcome to the podium. And please, the floor is yours. Mrs. Hoy, welcome. Your, uh your relative sat in the seat that I'm sitting in for many years right next to me, so uh, I'm sure you'll do uh, just as good as him, that's for sure. And welcome and congratulations, <laughs> <about on that. laughs> congratulations on your son's graduation from, from college. Thank you. Thank you. Your floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me tonight uh, to talk about something that <clears throat> I'm incredibly passionate about and I wish I wasn't. I wish I didn't need to be. Um, my name is Jen Fusco Hoy. A lot of you know 
my husband's family. Um, I grew up in Everett and I moved to Taunton in 1998 before my oldest son, Jimmy, was born. Um, we have three kids. Um, my oldest just graduated from UMass Dartmouth. He went through um, Friedman uh, Middle School and Taunton High School. My middle child is 19. She goes to Salve Regina University. She's made double majoring in elementary and special ed. Um, she would like to be a third grade teacher. And my youngest goes to Chamberlain. Um, we have several animals. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm a professional writer, editor, marketer. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> so please excuse me if I ramble because writing is my expertise, not speaking. Um, but I'm also a suicide loss survivor. Um, my brother, Teddy Fusco, um, he was a beloved son, brother, grandson, nephew, cousin, and friend. And even though my kids were his only biological uh, niece and nephew, he was everybody's favorite nephew. Um, he was born four months early in 1975. He weighed half a pound and was a miracle in so many ways. Um, during his short 41 years, he lived kindness. He was always willing and ready to help family, friends, and even strangers that he met outside of the Massachusetts State House where he worked as a DCR Ranger for nearly 20 years. Um, he died by suicide in May 2017, shortly before my son graduated from Taunton High School. Um, and his death shattered, shattered our family. Um, my kids, my parents, myself. It, it's Suicide loss is an incredibly <coughs> isolating loss because a lot of um, people, especially our older generations, view it with, with stigma and, and it, it's in the shadows mostly. Um, but walking has quite literally paved a path toward healing for me. Um, around the time of his third anniversary was the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And a pandemic he would have been prepared for with supplies and levity to get us through the early days. But at that time, I was tired and I was sick and I was depressed. And so I just, and everybody was home. And I started to just go out for little walks. And at the beginning, I would walk from my house on Eldridge Street to the Leonard School on West Britannia Street, which is not even a half mile, and took a break halfway. But eventually, I was walking 10, 12, 15 miles a day. Um, I've worked up to walking about 200 miles a month, sometimes more. Um, and in September of 2020, um, during Mental uh, Suicide Awareness Month, I started walking in memory of other people, not just my brother. Um, and I took my lifelong love of writing and used it as a way to connect with other suicide loss survivors and also to share information and resources that many people aren't even aware exist. Um, since that time, I've walked for well over 150 families. Um, and um, the AFSP marathon in a month popped up into my social media feed early this year. And um, I had been in a walking funk. It was following the holidays. We were heading into my brother's last eight weeks of Facebook memories that were popping up. And I thought, you know, this is a great way to help my family do something positive around the time of his anniversary. And because I walk so much, instead of pledging to walk a marathon in a month, I pledged to walk 300 miles, um, which I did mostly through the streets of Taunton. And I walked in memory of my brother and about 25 other families. Um, I shared their stories. And I also shared resources and information and things that families and parents can do. Um, I'm excited to say that not only did I complete my 300 miles, I exceeded it. Um, I was able to raise $11,000, which was 17% of the total amount raised. I was the top fundraiser um, across individuals and teams. Um, and I, I'm just so thankful that I was able to share all of these people's stories because it is making a difference. Um, you know, I, I started this Healing Miles Remembrance Walks to honor my brother, but over that time, families have messaged me, called me, texted me. <coughs> families, you know, in other states and local families. I've heard from 
parents of my 10 year old son's friends to, you know, people that I don't really even know that live in the city that say, I didn't know this information existed. I thought I was alone. My kid is struggling. I don't know what to do. Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, more than a few of the people for whom I've walked are children. Um, and it, it really brought to my attention kind of an opportunity that we have in the city. I and mean, we're known for being trailblazers. I and mean, we were founded, the first city founded by a woman. You know, the first American flag was raised on the green. Um, you know, we have a chance to, to make a difference. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, if we take a dedicated approach to community suicide prevention initiatives, it's a huge step in the right direction. And I can't thank you enough for the social emotional learning component that you're all committed to, but that's just a really small piece. Um, I've heard from a lot of local suicide loss survivors who have lost children and in the past, I don't know if it was this committee or prior committees, um, had approached the school committee to try to introduce suicide prevention education at the K through 12 level. And they've been told that it was too delicate for the kids in a number of different ways. Um, it's not. Um, it's the second leading cause of death for kids 14 to 18 in the US after unintentional injuries. And for our Asian American students, it's the leading cause of death. Um, in 2009 and 2000 to 2018, suicide rates for kids 14 to 18 increased by almost 62% and many more struggle with suicidal ideation and have made attempts that haven't been reported. And CDC reported in 2019 that one in five American youths considered <coughs> suicide, one in six made a plan, and one in 11 made a suicide attempt, um, and one in 40 made an attempt that required medical treatment. The CDC and AFSP both expect that those numbers to increase with the 2020 report given what they've seen and heard in emergency rooms and mental health facilities throughout the pandemic. Um, these are some of the children that I've walked for. Um, this is De the first is Destiny Petrie. She's 21. She was out of high school. Um, she was an artist who loves sunrises and paintings. And when I walk in the morning through the streets of Taunton and I see a beautiful sunrise, I always take a picture and send it to her mom. Um, this is Brandon Apollo Langier. He was 20. Um, he was an incredibly selfless kid who would take one paycheck a month and buy food for people he knew were hungry. Um, he had a dream of starting what he would wanted to call the Love Sandwich Project, which would address food insecurity where he lived. Um, Unfortunately, he passed away before that could happen. Um, but on his anniversary this year, his family allowed my daughter and I to bring <coughs> the Love Sandwich Project to the Taunton area community table where we were able to feed 40 families. Um, this photo of Brandon is the last one he ever posted on social media that he shared the caption, all smiles. Um, and the thing about Brandon that strikes me and I think of all the time is he had this unfinished list of 47 plans to love life that halted abruptly after number 38. But the number one thing on his list was to love himself. Um, this is Kai Harvey. He was 17. He came from a, a large, blended, happy family. Um, he and I have a shared love of the same rock band, so now whenever his, the song pops into my playlist as I walk, I think of him. On his recent birthday in February, I made care packages with Duncan cards and information about um, prevention hotline and passed them out as I walked. Um, Maura Reprecht, she was 16. She was the All-American girl. She was, played multiple varsity sports, club sports, um, her family was super involved in her community, and it was a shock. And a fellow parent said to her mom, if this can happen to your family, it can happen to anyone's. And it's true. Um, you know, suicide does not discriminate. Um, Maura's family was able to harness their grief and turn it into something positive. And they started a foundation um, and did fundraising. And they were able to bring uh, what's called the Hope Squad 
to their school system in Deer Lakes, Pennsylvania. It's a peer-to-peer -peer suicide prevention program, um, and it has been statistically proven to reduce suicide rates among teenagers. Um, this year, they raised so much that they have enough funds to gift a Hope Squad to another school system. Um, on the bottom left is Nene Marks. She was only 14, but she struggled with anxiety and depression from the age of seven or eight. Um, her mom didn't know where to go for help. Her mom didn't know what to say. Her family's teachers didn't know what they should do. Um, Many of you may know the Palm family of East Taunton. This is Casey. She died by suicide when she was 14. She was known as a sweet and kind girl who loved animals. Um, probably one of the more difficult walks that I did was earlier this year on her 21st birthday, I was joined by her parents and we walked on what should have been her final milestone as she entered adulthood. Um, Rebecca Finke was just 13. It was just before her 14th birthday. She was fun and loving. Um, her obituary tribute wall is filled with notes about how kind she was and about a girl with a smile that could light up a room and full of spunk. And the last one that I had to take a two week break from walking because it, it was just such an emotional day. Sean Savage was just 10 years old. He was a gifted student. He was every teacher's favorite helper. He created business plans for himself on a yearly basis, beginning in kindergarten, and helped adults with their own business plans. Um, on Mother's Day, I reached out to these moms and, and sent them my love. And his mom wrote back that she missed the homemade cards that would come home from school. Like, that's all she has left. Um, you know, when I say I hear from a lot of local families about the mental health struggles of their own tweens and teens, um, they often thank me for sharing some of the resources. Um, one of the things that AFSP has is a lot of programming um, geared for K through 12 schools, and most of it is free of charge. And when I say age, it's age appropriate. For the younger grades, they have um, a cartoon character named Gizmo that talks about big emotions. Um, another thing I wanted to share was, and this isn't on here, but you know, as parents, we learn the script to talk about internet and texting safety. And I was able to navigate a very difficult conversation with my 10-year-old um, the other day because I had learned it from, from school and from all of everything that we see as parents. Um, but that same day, a local 19-year-old showed up at my house and asked if she could ask for some advice on how to speak with her parents about how she was feeling. And through the conversation, she said the words, I feel like a burden. And from what I have learned through the Real Conversation Guides from AFSP, I asked her a number of questions, including, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Because a lot of people worry that by asking that question, you're putting suicide in somebody's head, and you're not. Um, if they're thinking about it, and by asking, you're showing them that you're a safe person to speak with. And I asked several other questions, and I followed the guide that I've read so many times, and unfortunately have needed to use more than once, um, and was able to connect to her mom, and I kept her at my house until her mom could come get her, because I didn't think it was safe for her to go home. Um, but she knew I was a safe person. She said she reads all of my posts, and they always brought her hope, so she thought she could come to me. Um, another thing I wanted to share with you is 13 Reasons to Fly. It's a wonderful program um, developed um, in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and the NAN Project. It was developed by a young girl named Isabel Cole, um, a friend of my daughter's. She goes to Salve Regina um, while she was a resident at Taunton State Hospital. Um, it kind of flips the script on the popular Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why, which kind of glamorizes and simplifies suicide and instead encourages teens and young adults to really think about what are their reasons to fly. It's a, a fully baked program that is available to any school system that wants it. Um, and she often comes in and does activities, but the school can do the activities themselves. Um, my favorite piece 
was a, a kite making activity, your 13 reasons to fly. The kids did a you know, collaborative project where they decorated, but they also wrote on dissolvable paper labels that people have given them that, have, <coughs> that are hurtful. And they dissolved them in paper and then created their own labels that they would do for themselves. So I want to give this to you if you want to watch it. It's, it's a wonderful program. Um, and then, of course, the Hope, the Hope Squad. And then, of course, increasing access to information and resources. Um, if we're able to normalize conversations around mental health and suicide and educate parents and educators, I mean, that would be a huge step, but it's not just educators and guidance counselors. It's anyone who has contact with a student, the recess aides, the janitorial staff, the cafeteria workers, the bus drivers, because those are the people that I think a lot of kids feel most comfortable with. So if you train them in what to look for and what types of questions to ask, I think it can go a long way um, to helping even just one kid not make such an emotional and final decision. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I was shocked that Massachusetts has a recommended suicide prevention training for educators, but it's not required and it's not monitored. Um, there is federal funding available for school systems to implement um, suicide prevention training um, it, that ha does have a social, emotional, and mental health component to it. Um, but there is a lot of federal funding available for that. Um, but it gives educators and school administrators a comprehensive way to implement policies in their community. And AFSP even has a guide for a model school policy. Um, so again, I thank you all so much for, for hearing from me. I know that this is a sensitive subject that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, but if we take away that, that discomfort and help just one person, we've made a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hoy. This is a powerful conversation. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Capral. Again. Um, thank you. This is something that I heard loud and clear when I took over as superintendent. And uh, I wish Mrs. Perry was here to have an opportunity to speak with you and discuss the work that she has done with our principals, our leadership team. Um, again, to start eliminating that stigma and to start educating our kids and our families and just to have those open conversations. Because again, if we can help one student, then it's worth every single effort. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of the committee? Uh, Ms. Doherty, Ms. DeMello. Uh, some, some time ago and um, for many years, there was a focus in the community on suicide prevention. You may recall the name Anne Marie Matulis, yep. who really led that a charge. Uh, uh, and I remember attending some workshops. Mr. Barada was the TPS point person along with some high school uh, guidance counselors. Julianne Babur was one of the guidance counselors, I think, that was taking the lead. There was some conversation about adopting curriculum, a presentation to this board, which I don't recall happening. Maybe Mr. Barada, if, if, if I might, uh, through you, through the superintendent, to Mr. Barada, uh, just can you just kind of revisit what happened to that conversation? Because you were very much involved in those workshops yourself, so. Right, and credit to, to you, Ms. Doherty, because when I came into the position of uh, Student Service Director, I know you worked well with uh, Michael Ferrari, who worked with Amory Matulis, and, and I carried on the work that Mike had started off. So the conversations went from um, adopting the curriculum, what did that look like, but more importantly is how do we get boots on the ground to support students where they were so we did participate in the um, uh, SOS training uh, along with assist training where we brought uh, multiple people to be to train and some of those guidance counselors still exist in the, in the system now uh, Stephanie um, Littlefield and Florence Canavan was also part of that committee so we we're in that little bit of a, a holding pattern working with Amory Matulus has been a, a fantastic resource for us as a district. Um, because we did discuss, one, not only what curriculum, and she thought through expertise it's better to have staff trained on site first as that first line of support 
to then be able to refer out to outside agencies for more uh, supports. Uh, the next aspect was looking at a policy, um, a formal policy in, in our uh, in our school committee policy packet, and and that's sort of where it sort of um, left off a little bit because we did create uh, templates of possible policies, and then we were going back and forth a little bit about how that would look in our in our policy manuals, and I think. It even came up in our discussions when uh, yourself, myself, maybe Mrs. Alameda, I think also Mrs. Fagan, when we were going with Jim Hardy, um, going through the, the packets of, oh, those were um, draft policies in the making that weren't at the table. We just said, hey, that's something we have to look at later on down the line for placeholders. So obviously it's a, a work still in uh, progress. And again, like Mr. Cabral said, uh, Mrs. Perry has continued this training with Sandy Hook and such. It's a matter of let's streamline streamlining the support and see where the commonality is and maybe bring those players back to the table of how best can we support the students. I think that would be wonderful. I think you should take advantage of the out-of-the-box solutions that um, AFSP offers. They're free of charge. They're age appropriate, and it goes beyond training the educators and guidance counselors because what they're finding is kids aren't going to go to tell the guidance counselor. They might tell their teacher, the little ones, but the older ones won't. It's more peer to peer and the people they come in contact with on a regular basis. And then as far as a school policy, AFSP has worked with le federal legislators to develop a model school policy. So to create one outside of that, I think is you're duplicating efforts and you may not be taking into account um, the $6 million of research that AFSP did last year around suicide prevention for K through 12. Um, you know, I, I would love to see that come back. Amory is still the, the chair of the Bristol County Suicide Prevention um, Coalition, and she has a ton of programming still going on. A lot of it has been virtual because of COVID, like everything else. Um, but one of the, the positives to come out of COVID is the amount of connection um, that I've been able to make and others have been able to make with others in the community um, and, and, and around, around the country um, about what other places are doing um, to implement strategies to help kids and to stop, I guess, dancing around the subject of suicide. Thank you, Mrs. Hoy. Just, just one I, final comment. Uh, uh, Kapral, I can connect Mrs. Perry with the group and Mrs. Matulis. Good. But it's, we in the district have also done it like an integrated approach. And just know that we've also developed, well, it also goes to our earlier presentation about how we're going to do outreach to families. And we're adopting the accelerated um, roadmap approach that Desi put out. We're really going to focus on late summer, fall, first couple months of school of really building connections with students and families and outreach. And we know that our uh, one of our school psychologists, Dr. Linda Watt, has worked with uh, CIT, a community input team, developing uh, an SEL curriculum where the first phase of those lessons have already been documented and uploaded, which primarily discusses about students, their feelings, how to connect with them, how to articulate their feelings and what that means. So. And articulating your feelings is an important piece, but social emotional learning is a small portion. Of, it's a really small piece. And enabling kids to talk about big emotions now will help them further down. But for the kids who are struggling, to have a 19 year old from Taunton show up at my house unannounced and tell me she was thinking of taking all of the pills in her house. And this is a, a, a girl from, a brilliant girl, a sweet girl, well adjusted girl. Her parent-child relationship was like one that I've envied. They're so close. But people don't know how to talk about it. So, I mean, I think we, we need to do more than just social emotional learning. And I know it's tricky and I know it's difficult and I know people feel uncomfortable and don't want to talk about it. I mean, I've lost more than a few friends, people who I've been friends with for, you know, 30 years stopped talking to me, didn't even send a text when my brother died, because they didn't know, they felt uncomfortable with the whole, the whole subject. And my openness and being vocal is uncomfortable for a lot of people. But over time, and it was even uncomfortable for my parents, but over time my parents have realized that, that I have made a difference, and by talking about it, 
you know, I, I have been able to help. And the stories of those kids have been able to help other parents start some really difficult conversations. I mean, the fourth grade parents aren't thinking, do I need to have a conversation with my child about if they've ever thought about hurting themselves? And, you know, because I am so enmeshed in this world, I do have those conversations regularly. And my 10 year old has thought about it, and he has intense anxiety. Um, my daughter's college essay was about the impact that her uncle's suicide had on her desire to become a teacher and her desire to bring more empathy and compassion and understanding um, to students' lives. Um, my, my older son, I mean, he's like missing his, his other best friend. It, it's, it's difficult. And when he was 17, we felt, oh, he, he understands what's going on, but he didn't, he struggled as well. Um, it, it's every age, and, and even adults, I think. I know, it, I know it's uncomfortable, and I know it's delicate, but it shouldn't be. If it's the second leading cause of death for American youth, we should be paying attention to it. So. Thank you, Mrs. Hoy. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, I know I had a couple of colleagues that have something to say. I just want to remind everyone, the administration said that they, they you know, Mrs. Perry's dealing with that, and having, having Mr. Cabral has Anything, yeah, any I mean, additional? I've already discussed our, well, an eagerness to sit down and meet and continue this meet conversation and talk about our work. So I again, appreciate, it's appreciate it. It's not something that we'll shy away yeah. from, but Thank we're you. a school system and we have 8,000 students that we want to make sure that we you know, address in an age appropriate way and making sure that our families are supportive of these initiatives as well. So it's something that we won't shy away from and it's a conversation that we'll continue to allow you and welcome you to have a seat at the table. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Superintendent Cabral. I have Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hoy, for coming in. Uh, it is a delicate conversation, and of course, uh, I think everyone in, in this room has probably suffered from a friend or a family member that committed suicide. I did personally, uh, a high school classmate committed suicide. It was one of those experiences that, you know, you think about it today, it's like, what the hell was going on in my mind back in 1982, and how it wasn't, uh, addressed appropriately. But uh, a couple of years ago, we sat at the PACC, and there was a student on stage that uh, went through uh, suicide issues. Uh, I think we all remember that. And you know what? I, I think we need to do something today. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next fiscal year. We need to do something today. So what can we do today to get this um, on our curriculum, on you know, making, making it um, visible to our students, to our parents, to the community, because this affects every one of us. And I need to know what we can do today that we can fix this or help correct this situation going forward. Are you able Mr. Cabral, to share the numbers me. on your... Excuse me. Sorry. Mr. Cabral. Yeah, so uh, we're in year three of the Sandy Hook Promise Signs of Suicide program pre prevention overview. So year one of the program, and I won't go into detail because Mrs. Perry can speak better to it than I can, but year one was to start with hello. Uh, year two, we trained our staff and we trained our students with say, say some, see something, say something. And then year three is we're, gonna to, we're going to begin to embed lessons in the health classes in our middle schools. So we're gonna to begin to introduce and talk about this, these topics starting this year. And again, it's been a three year process that was funded by the Attorney General's office. And this will be work that will involve training staff, training faculty, and then also training students. Um, so again, it's something that I've been, that was brought to my attention three years ago. It's something that Mrs. Perry has put on her radar screen as an initiative that I fully support and want to see the top public schools doing more work. And again, it's not going to be addressed just through our SEL program. It's going to be addressed in a more comprehensive uh, way. And if there's more that we can do, then we will do more. But I also want to be cognizant of the fact that there are some families that are not going to want to discuss this and they may opt out. And there are going to be some families that feel like we're not doing enough. And there are going to be some families that feel like this is just enough. So we're, we will do what we need to do to make sure that our families, our students, our staff, our faculty you know, are on the lookout and have an awareness of this very important topic. Okay, well, uh, I think we're three years too late and not to blame you, Mr. Superintendent, not to blame anybody, but you know, I think this is something that needs to be 
uh, at the forefront. Uh, as a school committee member representing the students of the Taunton Public Schools, I think it's, it's imperative upon me to make sure that this gets at the front of the line. And whatever needs to happen, uh, we have plenty of money coming in uh, that we could allocate to this. Uh, staff, education pieces, whatever it needs. And yeah, it's, it's a delicate conversation. There may be some families that don't want it, but there are many other families that do need it. So whatever we can do to make this happen, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mello. Mr. Pulowski? <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, Jen, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, this is powerful. Um, I appreciate all the work that you've done summarizing this for us. So uh, I appreciate the work that we've been doing. Um, I s appreciate the hard work that uh, Mrs. Perry has put into this. So I'm hoping that within the work that is ongoing, um, we can find room to uh, at least investigate these three resources that Jen has provided to us. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the Hope Squad because um, peer-to-peer in almost anything that you're talking about is going to be uh, at, le at least it, it's another avenue and it's a lot more effective. Um, I can tell you a lot of times trying to reach my own kids, sometimes they're reached more by, you know, older brother, cousin, what have you. So um, this is an important thing and, and we couldn't possibly do too much or do it too soon. Um, so. I, I'm certain the rest of the school committee would uh, support anything that we need to do. So hopefully we can we can look into this stuff and, and take advantage of the resources that are already there and the things that you know people much smarter than me have already figured out. So let's uh, let's do everything that we can. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Plusky. And I think the most important thing is that the superintendent superintendent stated twice that we're going to get Mrs. Hoy and Mrs. Perry in the same room. And they're going to share ideas and uh, see how we can move Excellent. this and forward. And I'm happy to connect you to yeah. um, Mrs. Ruprecht yeah. because she does have the funds to donate a Hope Squad to a, a district that is yeah. open to it. So and that Mrs. might be a conversation that yeah, you could have. That'd be good. Mrs. Perry will be able to if, keep the superintendent up to date, and I think that that's the way uh, that that'll be good. And I'm sure eventually we'll get a, a report on uh, what that good work is. Thank is you. Done. Have a good day. Uh, Thank you very much. Ms. Doherty? Did you have something else? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sousa. Just a request to Superintendent, you articulated a pretty comprehensive uh, outline, if you will, of what has been going on and what you are thinking of going forward. Would you provide that outline to the committee so that we can kind of follow along uh, in that regard so that when this issue number one comes up, when it is in conversation in the community, we can respond accurately and we know where this is going as you move forward in the planning. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, moving okay. along, presentations are done. We'll be on the superintendent's report. Mr. Cabral. Sorry about that. So in my superintendent's report, I provided you with four updates. Uh, the first update I'd like to provide you with is I, I was honored when the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents asked me to serve on the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Standing Committee, uh, which has met throughout the 2020-2021 school year. At this year's MASS virtual spring meeting, uh, the Mass Ready Standing Committee facilitated several small group discussions, which I was a facilitator of uh, one of the topics that centered and the topic centered on student voice and the challenges of leading work around race equity diversity and inclusion in your district and opportunities that lie ahead the meeting began with committee members deepening the understanding of those in attendance on race racism and anti-racist leadership by viewing a short video and hearing firsthand accounts from several superintendents from across the state. I can proudly say that the work that we've done this year in the Taunton Public Schools to provide blanket professional development and to establish uh, two committees uh, focused on this work is being seen as a model by other school systems who have personally reached out and asked us to share our work with them. So in addition to the Mass Ready Standing Committee, uh, we also developed a planning guide for superintendents who are just starting to scratch the surface of this very important work. And uh, I, can honest, I can probably say that the top public schools is ahead of the curve in that sense. 
So a strong desire exists to learn about equity work being undertaken by superintendents throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, we want to learn about obstacles, we want to learn about pitfalls, but we also want to learn about successes. So uh, where some are really thriving, there are others who are struggling. So this is where the MESS will come together. And uh, we also believe if it hasn't been done so yet, it may be done so in the near future. We believe the MESC is adopting the guideline that the MESS has developed. So some of you who read the new MESC newsletters may be seeing that in the very near future. Okay. Proud of that work, proud to represent Southeastern Massachusetts, and proud to represent the Southern Public Schools in uh, the work we're doing around race, equity, and diversity. Next in my superintendent's report, uh, I want to thank the school board members who could attend in person, and I also want to thank the school board members who could not attend in person but watched from home uh, when we presented our FY22 budget to the city council. So the FY22 budget, and uh, again, I cannot thank Assistant Superintendent Moynihan for helping to compile the information and all the, da and all the data uh, that we shared with this school board and also with our counterparts on the city. So the FY22 budget <coughs> presentation that was made before the city council <coughs> focused on enrollment and inflation. We talked about the FY22 Chapter 70 budget versus the original FY21 Chapter 70 budget. We talked about the impact of the Student Opportunity Act. We also educated the council regarding how we utilize our federal and state stimulus funds. And we also talked about new staffing and resources that are still needed. So Assistant Superintendent Moynihan and I also shared with the council the budget process that is utilized in the Tom Public Schools. It's a very comprehensive process. It involves many voices. Council members were reminded of the devastating cuts that the Taunton Public Schools endured the previous fiscal year. However, unlike the previous fiscal year, we are proud to state that the FY22 budget does not reduce staffing and gradually begins to restore line items that were zeroed out due to uh, the pandemic and due to the unforeseen uh, forecast for state revenues at that time. There was also much discussion regarding net school spending. So the council was also provided with per pupil expenditure charts and other information provide comparative data, data among school systems throughout the Commonwealth and departments throughout Taunton. And last but not least, we ended the presentation by highlighting our successes throughout the fiscal 21. So just to kind of give everyone a real quick snapshot of our appropriation. So our appropriation will include the charter school reimbursement, which Mrs. Moynihan and I have not included in the past, but the budget director has included it in this year's budget, present budget appropriation to the school committee. So the school department's appropriation increased by $164,929. I provided you with the breakdown. Our total appropriation from the city will be $92,837,637. We build that number by combining three figures. The FY21 appropriation, which is $90,414,000, and I'm missing a digit, I apologize. Uh, FY22 chapter 70 increase, which is $2,258,563, and the charter school reimbursement, which is $164,929. When you combine those three figures, we have an appropriation again of $92,837,000, $637, and we believe the estimated net school spending total will be 102%. Last two items, uh, again, we had a great and long-deserved James L. Mulcahy Elementary School dedication. I cannot thank Principal Dakota for her efforts, the Taunton High School Band, the Middle School Band, uh, Mrs. Moynihan and her staff, Mr. Barada, Central Office, team we all came together to put on a great dedication but it really goes to the Mulcahy staff and the students and Mrs. Mushro for making it one that we will remember. What I'm proudest of is the fact that we had every grade level represented from elementary, middle, and high school the way we should have every celebration in Tom Public Schools. And last but not least we had a great um, in-person high school and Taunton Alternative High School graduation despite the warm conditions it was a long overdue in-person graduation. It probably should have gone longer than three hours because those kids and those teachers really put in a lot of work to get, us, to get our kids across the stage when you consider what they've been through for the last 15 months. Uh, I want to thank, and I was very humbled. I mean, I think I'm going to have these three students write my graduation speeches from now on. I thought Olivia Weber delivered an excellent speech. I thought Aiden Scully did a great job as a salutatorian. 
and I cannot express how proud I am of our Olivia Dias. I mean, think about Olivia Dias as a freshman in this room when we sent her to MIT to be part of that Women in Engineering program, and there she is, three years later, four years later, as our valedictorian. So Olivia and her family, I am very proud of you, and I know we are gonna read amazing things about you and your classmates in the very near future. And with that, that concludes my report. You see him place on file? Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. On the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Just to receive Aye. a place on file, we'll, we, uh, on, on discussion, uh, why don't we vote on this, and then we can have the questions about the superintendent's report after. On the, on the motion, to accept the report. Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, I saw Ms. Doherty, then Mr. DeMello, I think, but I may have been backwards. <laughs> Ms. Doherty, then Mr. DeMello. Just uh, thank you, Mr. DeMello. The question uh, that I raised and later sent an email to you, Superintendent, regarding Gil Enos's conjecture that there was a difference between the number that he had and the number that we had as our final budget number of about 200,000 plus. So I'm just wondering how that was rectified and whether or not we need to take another vote on our bottom line for the budget if you didn't rectify that. I guess we could take it up on the old business and just make a motion to approve an FY22 budget figure in the amount of 92,837,637 just so it's official. Um, but I do know in the past the city uh, when we go through, when we, the city goes through the supplemental budget, we do not reconvene and make a motion to accept that new figure during the supplemental. So I guess it would be the wishes of the committee. If the committee wished to have a motion to accept that as our official figure, we could, or we could just treat it as additional revenue the way we receive additional revenue during the supplemental budget because we don't reconvene to, re to accept that new figure when we put in for a supplemental budget request. I, I, I think that, um I don't think we need to vote on it, but it, I'll, it's the wishes of my colleagues um, because I think that's the key is that we get supplemental money from the mayor's office we, we, we have in the past, and that just gets rolled over onto that appropriation. We've never voted on the additional money in the past. Now, I have, I have two people that can talk about this, and that's my colleague, Mr. Martin, who used to sit in that finance chair, and then they have uh, the dean over here who, um, who has some knowledge on that. And I'll go to the dean first, then Mr. Martin. Well, I'm going to say the, uh, it's unusual that we find the city giving us more than we ask for. I don't, I don't think that uh, it's really ne necessary because uh, the figure that we vote on is only uh, a presentation to them. The fact that they added on to it is, is uh, Wonderful news. So I don't. I don't think it requires a new vote, but just requires our gratitude. Yeah, and we'll spend it. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fiore. <clears throat> Mr. Martin. I think we should vote on it because when we talk about next year's budget, we're going to refer back to the appropriation for this year's budget. It's going to get confusing because someone's going to say, "Was it this figure? Was it this figure?" Uh, right now, there's two figures on the table the one we approved and the one that the mayor added to. So if we have a firm figure as a previous year's appropriation, uh, I think it would avoid confusion down the road. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And uh, the chair will now, uh, uh, the chair will rule that this is germane to the conversation of the superintendent's report. So I will entertain a motion to approve that figure right now. So moved. Second. Uh, on the motion, uh, discussion, Ms. Doherty. So just uh, for clarification, what figure are we approving? The one that Mr. Enos presented to us? Okay, yeah. so I, I think, uh, yes, yes, thank you. I agree with Mr. Martin. It creates problems down the road. Yes. Our budget is our budget. If they want to give us more money at some point, that would be delightful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. On the motion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, everyone, for that. Thank you, thank you, uh, my colleagues. Uh, and we already voted in the superintendent's report. So moving along on the on the um, on the. I'm sorry, Mr. Mello. I <laughs> I apologize. I had you written down here, but we kept rolling along, Mr. Mello. Just very quickly on the graduation, uh, is there an appetite for being outdoors in the future, or are we coming back indoors? Any idea? Could we have like an outdoor with a rain date indoors? That doesn't make sense. 
I think it would be difficult to pull off an outdoor and move all the chairs indoors on the same day. Uh, I think the preference would be to go back inside, um, knowing how how hot it was that day and how the water bottles were, were being passed along real quickly. And I did see, during while the 528 names were being read, I did see the paramedics periodically going into the crowd to assist students. So I think the plan would be to move inside. Okay, great, thank you, that's it. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Miller. And I think that, uh, one thing that one thing that I heard a couple of times from parents that I knew was that it's very interesting to have it on a Saturday at 11 a.m. because that gives them the rest of the day on Saturday and all day on Sunday. I guess to party, I guess is the best way to put it, but uh, rather than 1.30 on a Sunday afternoon, people have to go to work on Monday. So that's just a thought on the Saturday. I think that people enjoyed that, and especially at the 11 o'clock. And yes, we could also do 6 a.m., that's my time. Uh, Mrs. Fagan. On the note of being outside, when we used to do it outside, we had a trailer out there, we were in the shade. So <laughs> that, I thought that was, it was very hot out there, but if you happen to look down at the field, the football field is beat, and we could go out there. I would hate to do that, because I know you're looking to go out to bed to have that field redone, right? Yeah. Shortly? Yeah, we're just, well. It's we in tough shape. Yeah, we're just waiting to close out the fiscal year. And right. give you a sound number in our revolving account because yeah. if we can do the field and the track at the same time yeah that I might think be something it was palatable to do. to do it out there given the circumstances of what was going on because of the condition of the field but I wouldn't want to put chairs out there on a, a new newly done um, field like that so that it, it kind of fell right into place for us yeah, but and not to belabor this topic but the, the field itself, when you're on the turf, it is warmer on the turf than it is off the turf. So I don't know, I don't know enough about the science and the engineering, but the, the, you always talk about the field temp versus the actual temp. Field temp is always warmer than the actual temp. So that might be another reason why we move and inside. And really, black is not the color to wear in the middle of the summer either. No, no offense to the gowns, but I'm sure those, I, I saw kids that were, the gowns kept coming lower and lower because I know they were hot in the black gowns tough color in the summer. It's great in the winter, but not in the summer. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Yep. Moving along, administrative business staffing report. You see them place on file? Second. second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Reads quarterly report. Receive and place on file? Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moving along the subcommittee reports, finance and law. The cha chair of that is Mr. Martin. Finance and law met earlier this evening. We had four items on the agenda. One was student activities, there weren't any. Uh, second item was to open cafeteria bids for school milk and paper products. We got one bid from the uh, school milk, for the school milk, I should say, and two bids for the paper products. And those bids were uh, referred to administration for review and uh, <coughs> And what? <laughs> Recommendation. <laughs> the words slipped my mind. <clears throat> the third item on the bills payable was, uh, the third item was bills payable, FY21 uh, bills, $2,220,251.77. And that was approved by the uh, subcommittee. And we had a quick facilities update uh, summer cleaning is going on, getting ready for a summer school and for a September uh, Mulcahy. The tot lot is going to be done in maybe the next week or so. Uh, there was a school building committee meeting this morning. There's just tidying up loose ends. Uh, and also the uh, MSBA is looking to make uh, Mulcahy School a model school for the state of Massachusetts, which would be a nice recognition uh, for other cities and towns can use that as a, as, a, as a building block, as a model. And the windows at the Alternative High School project are going to start this coming Thursday. And again, that's a school building assistance program. And that's a report of the Finance and Law Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Wishes of the committee. Motion to accept the report and adopt the recommendations, or is that a second one? Second. Do I hear a second? Second. On the motion, uh, on the motion uh, discussion, Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, through you to Mrs. Monahan or Mr. Superintendent. Uh, I was part of the uh, subcommittee meeting listening, but I didn't exactly understand. Uh, on page three, on the Dell Financial, the 440-241.09, it was described as a buyout. So that was our lease that we had over three years. Uh, and why, why, would, why do we want to buy that out early? Well, since we had the funding now, we wanted to decrease our liabilities in the future. So what we ended up doing was buy out or finish paying the remaining amount on that Chromebook lease so, again, we wouldn't have future liabilities. Okay. And the, and the SW, uh, beside, what is this, does SW stand for anything? Uh, like I believe it's something with, it must be something with Jesse Coates. I do, I'm not sure. I could always look into that for you as well. So that, that money came out of the, what, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3, or where did that money come from? I would have to exactly confirm which account it would hit. But again, what we'll do anyways, because DESE did come about today as I attended a webinar this morning stating that we will have to go ahead and present to the federal, um, to DESE and the feds to show them what we have spent on exactly on our on our grants so that's something that we will list exactly and I think we've had um, we had shared that information to the school committee previously as well okay Th yeah that that's that's gonna lead me to my next question so the first one was the buyout of the leases that were even prior to the ARP or SS or anything like that correct All right. so now question number two is right below it mm -hmm. the six hundred eighty four thousand eight hundred uh, is that charged off to a federal grant? Yes, it has. It has been a charge to one of our federal grants, and that is for 3,200 Chromebooks to go ahead and replace the end-of-life Chromebooks that are no longer going to be able to be updated by Google and cannot be used for any type of testing. Okay. And, and is there usually a code next to the like uh, ESSA grant or something like that on there? Because that's why I'm asking the question. Well, the, it doesn't have the exact code for the specific grant, okay. but it does have the code for the grant. Right, I remember seeing that high number as part of the uh, ER, ER, ESSA 1, ESSA 2, whatever Correct. the it was. Okay, great, thank yeah, you so I, much. I, I, could, Mr. Cabral I, has something on yeah, that. If I could just add, uh, and this is just for the whole school committee. So Mrs. Moynihan and Mr. Martin and I, probably see these numbers and know what the numbers mean. So if you if you look at the middle of the page on the warrant where it says account, anything that starts with zero, one, hyphen three, anything that's zero, one, hyphen three is hitting the appropriation, okay? Anything that starts with one, two, hyphen three is hitting food service. And if anything is not one, zero, one, Three two or one two three, it's a grant. So as Mrs. Moynihan mentioned, the instructional technology to pay off the lease, which I instructed her to do because we want to get rid of our liabilities moving forward. Zero one three is an appropriation account, and then two three hyphen three would be a grant, most likely either S O one or the technology grant that we received in the amount or one of the technology grants. So that's what those codes, so if you're ever looking through the warrant, if you go right to the account, that's how you can figure out if it's a grant, appropriation of food service. I, I think I need, I need a little cheat sheet for that, okay? <laughs> I, still I, I have too. a lot of codes <laughs> with you. You said three by, to be three by five card. You yeah. have another question? Yeah, just last thing. I just want to be uh, recorded as voting present on page six uh, on, um, oh boy, voucher 159. One one in the amount of nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. Do you want me to present, amend please. my motion? Yeah, could you amend your motion? Yeah, you vote. I'll amend the motion so that Greg can take care yeah. of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Could I, I also ask? Hey, Mrs. Question? Faden, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Moynihan, you said that I heard you say that before. That this is my question. You talked about the end of life of the computer. <laughs> so my question to you is, what actually is the lifespan of any of those Chromebooks? And is it because the internet changes so much that they can't keep up with? Well, it depends on the processor. And as we, as you may know, a Chromebook has. Um, it has a different processor than a normal laptop does. And being a Chrome-based 
and I don't want to be sounding too techy, and I apologize, but what happens is a Chromebook average life is about four to five years. And after that, it cannot have the memory or the insides of the computer able to update. So therefore, they would have to be considered end of life, but we would go ahead and continue to use those computers for parts, so we will not need to surplus them or, you know, or dispose of them, because we will be using them as parts for other Chromebooks for repairs. So how, so how many now do you have at that stage of, of the many thousands that we now own? I do have, uh, I don't have the exact number, but we did purchase 3,200 Chromebooks um, in to replace end of life. So it could be around that. I do know that they were um, from a while ago when I was the director of tech. So those were, when I first purchased Chromebooks way back when, those are the ones that are now at the end of life. So I guess we can expect that every five years we're going to be... Purchasing other ones, yes, because they'll be considered to be end of life. Okay. One other question. The windows at, at Kohanet School, there's a lot of them that have been covered up in cardboard. Are those the ones being replaced? Are they all being replaced? Or are those going to become permanent walls with the cardboard? They are all going to be replaced. What happened was we had our... Um, our project manager was on site and they were starting to abate some of the windows to see what was in the structure to make sure that what they had and what they were going to be planning okay. for the work that they would be ready to go. So that's why you see some of those windows covered, <coughs> but all windows will be replaced at yeah, the alternative so high school. On them and I didn't know if they were going to be replacing, just making walls there or something or whether those were windows. Okay. Those okay. Are, I won't worry about that next time. I try those, to are lower, those are lower energy windows. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Cabral. Uh, Thank so, you. So the timing is perfect because I met with Mrs. Blano today yep. to talk about IT and IT needs and planning moving forward. So we, I did talk about the, I noticed the purchase as well and I raised that question to Mrs. Moynihan last week before I approved the warrant. So in meeting with Mrs. Blano, my first question is, do we have enough Chromebooks to go one to one next year? And we do. One of the things we're going to have to do as a committee is we're going to have to come up with a policy. Uh, similar to lost book policy, we're going to have to come up with a policy regarding the Chromebooks, which I'll work with the rules subcommittee probably this summer to have something in place for the school year. Are there a lot of them that are not back? No. I mean, I think I look, the number that I heard today from the graduating class, what, I mean, we had a class of, what, 528 that graduated, and it was, I think, 50 Chromebooks is what we're waiting to receive back. So I think that's a pretty good number, if you ask me. So and the other good news that I learned today regarding the Chromebook replacements, because we are going to have to continually replace them on an ongoing basis, is that they are going to be e-ratable. So whenever we replace a Chromebook, we will get up to $400 in replacement costs moving forward. So we'll have to put some money out ahead of time to make the okay. replacement, but we'll get it back in e-rate before the end of the fiscal year. So that's, okay. that's good news that will allow us to sustain the one-to-one -one initiative that we launched. It's almost a wash. Well, it's pretty close to a wash. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Martin, do you have anything? Just a quick question. I know that uh, vehicles are having trouble getting chips. Are we having any trouble getting any of the uh, components for these Chromebooks? As of right now, no. And thank, thanking to uh, Mrs. Blano and her team, and thanking Mr. Cabral, the superintendent, of course, approving us to get these Chromebook purchases way before other districts are. We are very fortunate to have everything that we will need to go into our one-to-one -one for next school year as well. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. I think that I think that's a, a, a good state, a great statement. Is that uh, rather than wait till the last minute, we try to hedge our bets, spend the, spend the money ahead. When the September comes, other people are looking for Chromebooks because the technology lacks, lacks across the world in, in chips and things like that. And it could be other parts, too. And, and we'll have uh, 8,000 ready to go for our students in September because they're going to come in September, whether we like it or not. Uh, on the motion to accept the report and adopt the recommendations of the Finance and Law Subcommittee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Martin. The we'll next item on the agenda is subcommittee reports. Okay. Wendy, did you get that on that one that Greg wanted to be voted president? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And the next item on the agenda subcommittee reports is special program subcommittee, and the chair on that is Ms. Doherty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Souza, and to my colleagues. So the special 
project subcommittee met on June 10th, uh, Nate Pulowski and Greg DeMello, uh, members of the subcommittee as well as myself, and Mr. Cabral was present at the meeting and also Marquise Taylor uh, uh, to present the program that he was thinking about for next year. The committee met to consider the recommendation of this body for us to reconsider the inclusion of TASC, the Taunton Area School to Career Program, and C4C, the Coaching for Change Program, in uh, our programming for the next school year. So the uh, motions that we would like you to entertain are before you. Uh, I think that I would first like to ask the superintendent to comment on the comments that have been made to him that he sought out in regard to the program that was implemented in the winter uh, first. I think that those comments are insightful, so I'd ask the superintendent if he would please. Is, is that coaching for change? That. You said program. Is that for coaching for change? Yes. Thank you. So the comments I'll share first come from our three middle schools, and these were comments made by the building principals and staff, and then I'll share with you comments from students as well. So high student engagement and enrollment, students enjoy the program. The program presents opportunities to strengthen relationships between students and staff. Additionally, the students enjoy being around the mentors. We also have feedback regarding glad to be able to continue the program through the pandemic and offer a few students an additional outlet. Ma sorry, this middle school definitely needs this type of program along with uh, the late transportation. Open to having the program run differently uh, if the goals are similar and they are in line with the school goals and approaches. Great experience for students to connect with role models during such a difficult time. It helped inspire students to want to work with others and to become mentors themselves. It gave students an opportunity to experience some joy. We're able to engage through games, which helped develop relationship skills. It was difficult to run virtually. Attendance did fluctuate. Uh, they had about 13 students attending uh, per session. They were disappointed that it had to end. Uh, it was, this is from the kids. It was good. Uh, had a lot of great activities, great mentors, happy it took place on Wednesdays. It was nice, uh, it but it was difficult being in back-to-back -back meetings, meaning being in a Zoom with a teacher, then going and meeting with their mentors uh, via Zoom. And it helped kids make new friends. But this middle school stated that the program was, was fine given the nature and the circumstances. Uh, C4C obviously has much, more value, has much more value when it's done in person and it was hard to get targeted students to attend or participate virtually, so they feel doing this program in person will offer more opportunities for students to participate, and the students missed the physical aspect, or the in-person aspect, excuse me. Uh, they missed the physical activities that were offered through K4C in the past, and students enjoyed connecting with the college students. So that was just some of the feedback from the adults and the kids who participated in the abridged version this school year. Thank you, Superintendent. Ms. So if I, might if I might continue, the committee after, um, well, first of all, this committee heard the presentation by both a representative from the Taunton Area School to Career Program about how important that program uh, is and their desire to continue on with their relationship with the Taunton Public Schools at least for the next year. Uh, and uh, secondly, from individuals whose children, families, and others uh, have benefited from participation in the Coaching for Change program. I had an opportunity to speak with one of the school principals about the winter program, and there was nothing but high praise that came from the participation of the children in, uh, in, in that, that particular school, and Mr. Cabral has shared that basically the same kind of information in uh, from the principals from the other two schools as well. So uh, we are making the recommendations that you see before you. So we might want to start with the Coaching for Change recommendation. But first, I'd like to ask uh, both Greg and Nate if they have comments before we entertain that motion, before the chair entertains that motion. Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Chair Doherty. Uh, yeah, w w I, I think the committee needs to understand that uh, it's, it's not a, a one-time fee like we were paying in the past. It's a per-mentor fee. And 
it's as many as we need per school and as many schools you want to put it into, right? Especially our middle schools and I think we mentioned elementary at some point. But, uh, and it's also during uh, the day. It's not an after school program. I don't know if that's been discussed yet. So I think those are a couple of key points mm -hmm. that have changed quite a bit from when coaching from change was in the system two years ago. That's all I want to add. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mello. Mr. Pulowski. Uh Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually read the, the comments that it sent uh, to Mrs. Darty. Um, so I strongly support both the Taunton Area School to Career and Coaching for Change programs. If properly implemented, these programs will have a major positive impact on our most valuable students and will pay dividends to TPS over time by helping to cultivate a pipeline of teaching. However, we must have clear and focused oversight over both programs. A person of authority that is not one of the teachers actually doing the work must have visibility throughout the process and must be able to report with confidence about the effectiveness of these programs. Uh, three years from now, when the school committee must decide whether or not to integrate these programs into our standard budget, they must be able to make an informed decision based on past performance and impact to our students. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Pulaski. And I'm just going to add, I'm just going to add that um, although I'm not on that subcommittee and I did not uh, go to the meeting, I did watch it, um, and I. Um, I think during the last year I used that word the Taunton High School, you know, the Taunton Public Schools cast this account about 60 times and I said how am I going to watch it and I watched it online on the cast account and it worked perfectly and so I did watch the whole meeting and so I do have a few, I'll have a few questions when, when the time comes but it's not nothing serious and Mr. Mine has a question. And this goes to what Mr. DeMello said, how, how, <clears throat> how did you explain the, uh, the monetary part? Uh, the monetary part is a per, it's a fee per mentor. So it's not a flat fee. So we're only going to pay up to the amount approved by this committee, which I believe we established $125,000, but it's not a one-time fee. It's per mentor, per school, and there's a ratio, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was 1 to 8 or one up to 1 to 16, I believe it was. If you want to refresh my memory on that. So, so. So it's, it's on a need basis and it's per mentor. So this motion that is soon going to be made, uh, I would assume that's not to exceed 125. Yeah. Uh, and if it were to exceed 125, you'd come back to the committee for? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and, and, and I think uh, the other thing too is the, uh, the recommendation, uh, it, was, it was the work of the superintendent and um, the uh, director of coaching for change that yeah, I think uh, before you take additional questions, the superintendent, there is a distinction, a great distinction between the program that has been offered in the past and the program that will be offered going forward, which is a model modeled on the four or five weeks that was spent in the in the winter time. Um, you, you can school manage, day, you the can school manage the model. yeah school right uh, at some point I'd like the superintendent to I, I think that talk be a good place about what that we'll program looks like. Two questions from my colleagues. Just uh, just a quick summary on the school day model. Yeah, so this actually the school day model that intrigued me was the school day model that's being used at my former middle school in Florida, Massachusetts, at the Henry Lord. So in the past, you may recall that there was a hundred and forty thousand dollar fee. There was a late bus fee, and then there was also fees of stipends or weekly, sal weekly extra detail that was also offered to staff. So that made the program cost of about, I think in the past we were paying somewhere close to 400000 So the way the program has morphed and evolved over time, it is now during the school day. So if I am attending our largest middle school with close to 900 students, all 900 students or any of the 900 students who need the support of a coaching for change mentor can have access to that mentor during the school day so that's that's a change the mentors in my former middle school are pushed into the classroom to support and engage kids the mentors can push into the cafeteria to work with students groups of students and the ratio they try to use is one to eight per hour 
So if they're there for two hours that day, that's 16 students. If they're there for three hours that day, that's 24 students. So what's also nice about it is it's on an hourly basis and you can rotate different students in as needed. So it's $3,500 per mentor, five to seven hours a week, 40 weeks throughout the school year. So that, and that's the way the program was set up. It can take place in school, in the cafeteria, or in the classroom. Uh, we're talking about a ratio of maybe two, one to two coaches, mentors in uh, elementary middle schools, one at the alternative high school, and possibly four at the high school because they have four houses. So that was the, uh, so we, when we did the math, it looked like about 24 to 34 mentors. So that would be a budget of around 84,000. If it was two mentors per school, plus the high school, or 34 mentors, if we did more and did four at the high school, that'd be a budget of 119,000. There is some soft costs, and the soft costs are professional development for our staff. So the total soft cost would be about 6,000. So you're looking at a budget range of about 90,000 to 125,000, as Mr. Martin said, not to exceed uh, that cost. The rollout plan, would, if approved by the committee, would be uh, once there's approval, July and August, the Coaching for Change in the, our schools will identify and train staff. They will receive professional development during the months of July and August. July through September, Coaching for Change will recruit the college mentors. September, October, there will be an orientation for the staff to meet and be matched with their mentors. And then in September, October will be the launch. So that is pretty much the summary of what we discussed. I don't think I missed anything from my presentation. No, and I, um, before I take a question, I just want to let the two colleagues that had their hands up. Uh, one thing that I liked about it was that they, it allows the program a little flexibility so we can service more students by going with the individual mentors to X amount of students. So it can grow if, if you need to, depending on how many kids need service. And, that's, and, I, and I really uh, thought that that was a, a pretty well thought out uh, plan. I have Mrs. Almeida, then Mr. Fiore. Thank you. Okay, as I'm reading this, um, so are we gonna, we're gonna pick who the staff member is and then we pay them individually? Is that a stipend for them? Because they're gonna be responsible for the program? This will be done during the school day, and the only compensation will be professional development that the staff members will participate in during the summer months, and that would be a total cost to the district, not to the individual. Total cost to the district, 11 teachers at the contracted rate, 16 professional development hours, up to 16 professional development hours would be $6,000 to the district. And again, this is being done during the school day, not after school, so there would be, it would not require an extra detail. Okay. So when we did the budget, Mr. Cabral, you gave um, X amount of money to each school for school improvement funds, and you told us that that money could be used for coaching for change if the school decided to do that. So you're still giving the schools that same amount of money, and we're paying for coaching for change? I, I still have every intention to have our schools fund their school improvement plans. <coughs> So if this school board approves 125,000 and we provide each school with the number of coaches that we identified uh, through this funding, then that frees up their turnaround or their school improvement funding to do additional programs, additional professional development, additional after school acceleration programs in their buildings because that'll free up dollars that, I, that we had approved through funding the school improvement plans. So are you, am I hearing that we could have coaching for change during the day and then again after school? If a school wished to do that, they, they could. But what we're proposing, I think what Mrs. Doherty and the special programs subcommittee is, is recommending is the in-person model. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um, did I hear that it's gonna go into the elementary schools? I thought we were just doing middle schools. No, we could also go into the elementary schools as well. And they're going to be there during the school day? During the school day. So Is anybody going to be pulled out of their classrooms to do coaching for change? Students could be pulled out of their classrooms. Students could be pulled out of their specials. Again, the model that is working very well in my former middle school 
is the, co the coaches will go into the classroom and support the learning that's taking place in the classroom, not like an assistant, not like a teacher, but they're in the classroom like a volunteer supporting mm -hmm. the learning taking place in the classroom. Okay. Uh, another successful model is the coaches being in the cafeteria in a more social environment, working with the students in, in that capacity as well. So I like the idea of students being able, well, let me use the example when I go into classrooms as part of the, uh, fin I can't think of the financial literacy program that I volunteered in this building. So I go in as a, I go in as a mentor, I go in as a volunteer, and I spend most of the time interacting with the kids and talking about financial literacy. Junior, junior achievement. Junior achievement. Yeah. So I see this as a form or somewhat like junior achievement where the mentors are in there mm -hmm. supporting the students, working with the students who need that level of support uh, in order to support the teacher who is teaching the whole group or working with a small group with the ed assistant or with the teacher. So it's an extra mm -hmm. person Mm -hmm. that the students can relate with. And I think Mr. Pawlowski said it best. My kids will listen to their aunt or their uncle before they listen to me. Or to someone who's you know, a friend of the family who's older than them, but yet closer in age than I am because I'm an old man, Mrs. Almeida, and I know nothing. But those kids or those that, young Mr. adults. Cabral. I've been there, done that. <laughs> those young adults can have a better connection, a better relation with the kids. And again, anytime a young adult walks into any classroom, yeah. from my experience in this building, you know, those kids drop everything and they give that young adult their undivided attention. So I see it as a way to really connect with okay. our kids. All right. So my K other question. K through twelve. My other thing is when um, the gentleman from Coaching for Change came before the committee back a while ago and he had a grant to do Coaching for Change. They were supposed to come back and talk to the committee about what went on. Um, this has been months and they've never come back to this full committee to explain what transpired and what kind of... Um, uh so the, shame on me for not scheduling that presentation, but I can work with Marquise to, um, he did provide an overview of the work that took place. Again, it was, it was an abridged version because of COVID and the fact that we came back in person. Uh, luckily, we came back in person, so that's a good thing. But I can provide you with a presentation or what a summary of what took place in our three schools. I still think that we can do coaching for change in-house less money because it sounds like we're doing that anyways we hired all these extra people this year with that money and there's no reason why we need to spend another hundred and twenty five thousand dollars but that's my personal opinion thank you thank you mr uh miss almeida i just want to remind my colleagues that we have the the potential motion uh in front of you and part of that motion and uh, my colleague, Mr. Pulowski, made it that night is to have a, a uh, follow-up in effectiveness of the program. So uh, we will get some kind of feedback on that, uh, on, this, on this new uh, day, school day model, I should say. I have Mr. Fiore and Mrs. Fagan. First of all, my mother graduated from Henry Lord. So, um, but... Um, we just quibbled over what we were going to use for a budget figure, and now we're, we're putting this in. What's going to be the funding source for this? This will be ESSA 2 or ESSA 3. And my daughter is in graduate school, so we reached the point where she lectures me. <laughs> I agree with you on that one. Uh, Mrs. Fagan. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Cabral, the... Uh identification of the responsible person per each school to work with this program you don't intend to pay them anything it's happening during the school day and well yeah but that's an extra duty I mean we always seem to have things for extra duty so, so. If this committee would like to offer a stipend to the staff who are working with the students I could entertain that but right now it's, it's not what I'm asking I just wanted we to ran know. A, we ran an abridged version this year and there was not a request to provide a stipend during the school year okay uh, the other thing I'm concerned about is it says now they're going to be the social emotional people what were they before 
They were providing social emotional support. Mr. Cabral, I sat with you one day at the high school, th that restaurant, the cafe, talking about two teachers who wanted to come in and help with something and helping kids with reading and stuff. And that wasn't flying and you were concerned about the educational piece. Are we still concerned about the educational piece? Always. Well, where's the backup for what they're doing to help the kids with the educational piece? And the other thing I want to know is, where are you going to find the time during the day? They're pretty chock full so with all these classes they have to take. Because isn't everybody on rotating schedules to pick up art and music and all that other stuff? So the educational piece we're addressing through our accelerated learning plan. So during the summer, we're going to have a robust summer program. During the school year, we're going to have after school programs. We're going to have weekend programs. I'm sure some of our schools, as they do now, will run before school programs. So we're going to have the educational piece covered. Uh, these next two to three years, I can't emphasize to this group enough, enough, how vital these next two to three years are going to be in addressing the holistic needs of our kids, academically and social emotionally. So now we have an opportunity to utilize Coaching for Change in a different capacity at a greatly reduced cost, and we have a year to analyze if it provides the impact that I, that I think it will during the school day. The model that can be used during the school day can be a push-in into the classroom, so students aren't leaving the classroom. It can be utilized in the cafeteria, and we all know we can always use extra hands in the cafeteria. Or it could be done you know, creatively, maybe through our guidance counselors. Our guidance counselors do small group instruction or small group pullouts all the time. Those kids are missing art, those kids are missing academics, those kids are missing lunch. So if we could provide our guidance counselors who are working with students who need a little love, as Mrs. Uh, Kurt likes to say, or if we can provide our assistant principals with an extra layer of support with, for students that they just don't seem to have that connection or they're struggling to connect with for whatever reason, then I think it's worth a try. And at a cost of 125000 which I know is a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but it's, we're utilizing our ESSER, it does align with our strategic plan, and it also does align with what we're trying to do in these next two to three years. It's that we're going full head on trying to address the needs of our kids. I'm, and if, if we can help one kid in each building at this cost, I mean, we've spent more sending kids out district I for help. That, so Mr. I think Cabral, it's worthwhile if we can use 125,000 versus right. 60, 40, 200,000 to send kids out of district. I think it's, it's a good use of our funds I, to I provide all our say, kids with help. But I also know there's kids that, that don't have four days of a subject. I mean, they'll have four days and the fifth day's out on something else. That concerns me in elementary school. It doesn't mean they have to be out every day, though. It's just, I'm worried about what they lose. And I'm also worried that if a student isn't in the right frame of mind or isn't in the right place, what are they going to learn in the classroom when a teacher's trying to learn or trying to teach them? Wasn't that why we have all that group learning, or is that now going somewhere else? Is that all going to change now? We're, we're, of we're mixing, Mrs. Fagan, would, I mean, you know I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. And, but I'm and, just wondering. But we're, what, we're, mix, we're mixing two things. We're mixing academics with social, emotional, or, or wellness with someone's health. Well, I. With two different things. I, and, I understand, but I've told you, I feel like sometimes we get so much stuff on the plate, we can't possibly address everything. And that's the part that bothers me. And I'm trying to think what's the most important thing we have to do here. And that's we, my concern about it. And I, right now, for, for the next two to three years, everything is important right now. And even though things are feeling normal right now, look at us all sitting here in a pretty normal state. I mean, I had a meeting with the commissioner today. And again, it's accelerated learning, accelerated learning, mental health. We just heard a presentation. So we really need to look at this holistically Two to three years is gonna go by real quick. And if we don't make the impact on our children now, we're gonna be back at this without the funding resources trying to help our kids. And who's, who's doing this um, program in the summer for the teachers? Who's, who's gonna be training the teachers? Coaching for Change has a curriculum or has a professional development that they offer the staff. And who teaches that? I believe it's either their staff or somebody that they've contracted. That's, a, that's something that they I just, provide. Just wanted to know, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fagan. Mrs. Almeida. 
Thank you. I I'm just concerned the direction that this committee is going into. First of all, I don't recall, and maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me, Mr. Chairman, was this referred to special programs to discuss and not the full committee? Uh, the last meeting, uh, special program said that they were going to handle it. I can't hear you. I said, I said that the last full meeting, special program said that they were, it was going to go into special is this programs. In the in the, is this in the minutes? I'm assuming. Okay. But that's my understanding. I'd like to that see those, that in the minutes, number one, because nothing that's, if it's not referred to a subcommittee, a subcommittee can't take it up. That's, that's the direction of our committee. And that bothers me that we weren't informed well in advance that this was going to happen. Because I would never have supported a motion like that until we had this gentleman come before us and explain to us what went on in those after the six weeks. He got the grant from the savings bank and he was supposed to come and explain to us what was happening. And you know, it's very important and it's very confusing to have people in. It's one thing when you're on, um, vir, you know, uh, what do you call that? Virtual or Zoom or whatever for a classroom. But when you're having people coming into the classroom, physically coming in, it's disturbing to the other children. So I have concerns about that too. So I understand that it helps kids in one way, but in another way, I don't know how much it helps if they're coming in or a child's being pulled out. We as a committee stopped the pullout. That's why we have inclusion. We stopped pulling kids out of classes to go to, to do things like this. So that's my other concern. And I don't know if I like the direction that we're going into if we're pulling kids out of classrooms. I have to think about this hard because I'm not in favor of pulling kids out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think um, right now everyone's had a chance to um, to weigh in on this. I think I'll ask uh, the chair of the special program subcommittee to read the motion and um, we'll, for coaching for change, and uh, we'll entertain that motion to approve your recommendation, and then we'll vote on that, and then we'll go back to task. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Mr. Palowski, as a member of the committee, has had his hand up. So if you don't mind. I had two other people that had them too, so I'd rather just. Well, they, both, both of these gentlemen but, are members of the committee. Yeah, so. if they if they want to talk, I'll I'll let them. But I, I figured if we go to the motion, it'd be everyone had a chance already. So if we go Whatever to the motion, I think that's the best thing to do. Both uh, Mr. Polowski and Mr. Demello have said they're okay. Yeah. So the motion is before you. I'm not going to read it to you. But that is the motion that's on the floor in the rec as the recommendation of the special so projects. Committee. There's a motion on the floor to appropriate 125,000 for coaching excuse for change me, program to Mr. implement. Chairman, excuse me. It's yes. Up to. Yeah, up to. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just read. No, no, up to. I you said, sorry. Uh, I just want to read it for anyone that's watching. So the, the motion is to appropriate up to 125,000 for coaching for change program to implement during the FY 2022 school year using the during the school day model focus on social and emotional well-being the program will be implemented in the middle schools and elementary schools one time public schools will identify a responsible person for each school to work with the coaching for change during the program's implementation hold the pro hold them accountable for the program deliver deliverables and routinely report to the superintendent and school committee regarding the progress and effectiveness of the program two Coaching for Change will work with time public schools to develop an agreed upon scope of services. And that's the motion made by Ms. Doherty. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. DeMello. On discussion, Mr. DeMello. I'd like to uh, amend the motion to include not only middle and elementary, but also high school. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's uh, Ms. Doherty made the motion, so as long as she's amenable to that. I'm sorry, say again, please. As long as you're amenable to the, uh, the amendment, he wants to amend to include high school if needed. Uh, yes, I don't, it's a friendly amendment, and so certainly we can include the high schools. I'm not sure that the resources they were appropriating as will, the administration will cover seems. it. So yeah. if, in fact, it doesn't, superintendent will come back with a recommendation. Yes. Yeah. Is that the high school seems comfortable to you, superintendent? No, when we, when this group met, we did factor in the alternative high school parents. Okay, right, so fine. 
Excellent. Thank so there's a friendly amendment to include so the, the schools as, as uh, presented. Uh, the motion is seconded on the floor. Uh, the chair will entertain the vote now. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. We have uh, two, four, we have uh, six, four, and two opposed. Did you get that, Wendy? Thank you. And continue on, Ms. Doherty, with the, the, the task uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the task, task has been the Taunton Area School to Career Program has been a partner of the Taunton Public Schools for 25 years, as was stated by the individual who came to present uh, her ask for continuing the program for the next year. They have uh, fallen upon hard times, not, not the Association for Human Services, but the program um, cannot operate at the high level that it has been operating, particularly to serve the youngsters in the Taunton Public Schools without these additional funds uh, in order to continue forward at the, in the way in which they have done. Uh, so I think that the students, much like any supports for social emotional learning, this program indeed includes that where I have heard stories from people over the years that have been mentors to young people from the high school uh, who continue their relationship with those young people as the years have gone on because those bonds have been closely held and very beneficial to those young people who participated in those programs. So I am uh, on behalf of the committee asking this committee to appropriate up to $125,000 as you can see uh, with a scope of services to be uh, determined in a sit down with the uh, superintendent and, and or his designee uh, and the people from task uh, going forward. So that's, that's the recommendation. And I would ask my colleagues if they wanted, want to add something to that. Mr. DeMello. And Thank you, uh, Mr. Souza. I, I think the only uh, caveat is uh, I'm very concerned about our students going out into the uh, workforce without compensation and I, I think that it's it's important that we not uh, just write a check for $125,000 but uh, we incorporate funding from that 125 to support our students in a paid internship because so I think that that also not only rewards them for them but it gives them the value of the money uh, and working for the money for those that have never experienced a, a real job I think that's important and I also had requested that we get a update on the organizational chart. I know that there's been a lot of changes going on uh, at TASC, and I think we need to underst better understand, you know, what, where, where they're at right now before we start writing out checks. Those are the only two concerns I have, but I do support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. Uh, Mr. Pulowski, then Ms. Almeida. Uh, thank you. So. Um, <coughs> I, I myself served as a mentor for the task program years ago along with uh, Mayor O'Connell and former Superintendent uh, Dr. Hackett. Um, so it's a great program. Um, I can't overstate the importance of mentorship um, as well as uh, paid internships. Um, and I would further that, you know, if, if TASC is going to be running this program, uh, I think it would be incumbent upon them to um, assist in, uh, you know, placing the students in these internships and you you can work it out with the employer to, to pay the students i mean that's been my experience in the past and um you know i'm, I'm, I'm certain we we would have no shortage of uh, people helping out on that um, but it, it's an important program we've we've had it for many years in the past and um, i fully support uh bringing it back as long as that we've got um as stated here um oversight from a responsible person to hold them accountable to the deliverables and uh, be able to present to the superintendent and this school committee, um, you know, a, uh, a report on, on how effective it's been over the year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulaski. Mrs. Almeida. Again, I don't think it's up to the school department to pay the students to go out and be interns. It's up to whoever um, they're hiring or up to task to do it because I don't believe that that would be an expense that we could um, do. Could we pay our students and give them a 1099 or put them on a payroll? Uh, actually, I, I, I we're, we're put in the, the process to the superintendent because yeah. we're the, in the process of exploring that and the initial feedback I'm getting is that it may be possible, but I'm just going to confirm that if this school committee does um, appropriate funds for paid internships, then it is feasible. It's no different than when we hire students 
to work on our summer programs as interns or as mentors or as educational assistants. So think about the IT department. Uh, if you visit our buildings during the summer months, you're going to see high school students you know, setting up the classrooms for the teachers or breaking down the classrooms for the teachers. So I, I believe it would be within the jurisdiction of the school board to, to approve that and we are finalizing uh, that information so that we can make sure that we're not violating any Massachusetts but, general laws. Okay, I understand that, but that's them working in the school department. So we assume any kind of liability that happens as far as workman's comp and those kinds of things. If we assume the responsibility of giving them a paid internship in another area and so, God forbid one of them gets hurt at work, who's assuming that liability? Well, I, I do know in my work when I was uh, Mrs. Moynihan's position that in working with the city risk manager, if it's a school-sponsored event, so an internship that is sponsored by the school department through task and a, uh, and a partner. And I do know when our students would go out, because this was a concern, I think this school board raised several years ago, if a student is driving to their internship or to their mentor, to meet their mentor, and there's an accident, does the city's insurance or the, does the city's liability coverage still cover that child and cover the school dep department? The answer was yes, but we can also reach out to the risk manager to make sure that the schools, the city's umbrella policy would also cover the students. I'd like to make sure that that's the case before I vote on it because um, I'd hate to say we're going to vote on something and then it's not going to be a good vote. And the other thing is, um, we had discussed task before, and um, I thought we were going to have someone in-house handle that mentorship. Unfortunately, that was not approved as part of the ESSER 3 and ESSER 2 spending plan. Uh, the, the school board only approved fiscal 22, and the internship coordinator that I believe I, we recommended was not approved and that was put on hold for fiscal 23 or fiscal 24. So this is a way to provide that service where we would have an internship coordinator. And I, do, I don't think I need to remind this group that the internships is, plays a vital role in our Chapter 74 approved funding. Because part of the scope and sequence, the students have to take courses, complete a capstone, or participate in an internship. So this would also secure or make sure that we are meeting the regulations on the, on the Chapter 74 and getting all the Chapter 74 funding we are entitled to. So this, in, in theory, this may pay for itself. That's why I think it should be someone in-house, and I had that discussion before, because I, I remember when we had um, the work study at Taunton High where kids got jobs and they were able to go out and they were mentored out in the field and there was a woman in the guidance department, I can't recall her name, who handled all that. And, and we had more control over our students because of the fact that we knew where they were more. And we kind of hand-picked, or the school department hand-picked the jobs that they were doing. And it was that person's responsibility to do that. And I don't think that we paid anywhere near that amount of money for someone to do it. But this and I know that other school districts are part of task, and we pay the most money out of all the districts. There's no equity there. But what I and again, the 125 will be the 125 thousand dollars will be appropriated if if approved, appropriated by the Taunton School Committee. In my office, we're working with the high school. We've already come up with some ways in which we can maybe even expand task while also getting an internship coordinator. Because an internship coordinator will not, you're right, Mrs. Almeida, an internship coordinator will not use up the full 125,000. So we may be able to identify some services for the alternative high school. Uh, I would love to see the career folders that we, that I remember using at Parker, you know, make to take a leap to the 21st century and maybe we utilize task in our middle schools uh, with Naviance to start getting our middle schoolers thinking about careers so when they get to the high school it's not the first time that they're talking about careers. So I think the $125,000 uh, could be used very creatively 
to give us the internship coverage that we need and also to provide the alternative high school and the high school with additional supports that they've lost. And we may even be able to figure out a way to get our middle schoolers thinking about career pathways or CBTE exploration, which will only strengthen the programs and maybe lend itself to growing more programs. So again, that's, that's the way I picture this rolling out and whatever this committee wants to allocate, I will make sure that every dollar gets used wisely based on the recommendations of the school department. Thank you, Mrs. Almeida. I, I just have a couple of uh, questions on this. And uh, quickly, the task presentation, I, I, this is a subcommittee report. I know in the past, task has had a budget and that services high schools in the area. Our $125,000 appropriation is just for our kids, right? Mm -hmm. We're all in agreement with that, right? Okay. And then the, the other thing that's confusing me, and, and I'm going to send it to the superintendent at the subcommittee, and that's I've been here for a little bit of time, and this program, the task, has been more of a mentorship than an internship. So um, the mentees, is that the right word? The mentees, uh, meet with the kids, teach them, you know, and these, and these kids need, need it because they don't have any, any adults in their life. And they, they meet with their, with their student and they talk about careers and they may take them out to dinner, ball games, and et cetera. And then um, that could lead to the kid exploring other career college opportunities and things like that. Now, this particular program we're talking about internships, which is a different animal, which is fine, and um, I know we need internships with CVTE. So is the scope a little bit of both on this? And, and is that what the concept is that, we, that uh, the subcommittee was talking about during that meeting? Because I didn't get that feeling that it's still, I, I don't want to move from mentorship <coughs> to internship and all of these kids that we had over here are gonna, I wouldn't say fall by the wayside, but not get the services that they needed by having a mentor. Yeah, I, I mean, and I would welcome the subcommittee to chime in. M the way I picture it, it's the evolution of town public schools. Yeah. Uh, the evolution right now, the need is for internships. Yeah. Uh, every college meeting I attend, <coughs> there's a, all we're, all we're talking about is early pathways and dual enrollment and internships, exposure. So I think it's part of the natural evolution where we can use a portion of the money for internships. We may be able to use some of the monies for mentorship. And again, we may be able to do other programs or bring in a new group of students. What was also originally proposed was proposed by task. Yeah. One of the, during our conversation, I made the recommendation that maybe we should be the ones meeting with task after we meet with the high school guidance counselors, CBE department to develop a scope of work and say, this is what we need. Can you provide us with these services at, within this budget? Yeah, and that's part of this motion, which which we'll read in a few minutes. Which is which is the, to me is, is the linchpin on this. And uh, we have a point of information that I'll go to my colleagues out here. <clears throat> there wasn't any cost to the mentorship because the mentors weren't paid. And because I was one way back. We were still paying tax. Oh, we were paying tax. Yeah. Okay, but the uh, the mentoring portion was uh, volunteers. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Pulaski, and Mr. Demello. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was my understanding that um, the scope of the work the task would be doing would be open to both of those things, the mentorship program and facilitating an internship program. Um, you would think the internship program would be for our oldest students at the high school, uh, whereas a mentorship program, there's really no limit on what that could service. And I think the most important point here is exactly what uh, Superintendent Cabral um, recommended is that a task will work with TPS to develop an agreed upon scope of the services. You know, we want to we want to open this so that it benefits as many of our students as possible. So I think we have to trust in the um, the principals, the guidance counselors, the leaders of the schools to know what is needed most for their students. Um, so that collaborative effort forming that scope rather than just tasks telling us what they can do, 
uh, we would want to present what we want. And if TAS can provide those services within that budget, that's what we would do going forward. So that, that was my understanding from, from when we got out of the meeting, and that's, that's certainly what I, what I support. Good. And, and, you know, the other thing is I think the right word is evolution. Mr. Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Mr. Cabral's point, or somebody's point, I mean, we shouldn't have any student out there without getting paid. I don't give, I don't give a damn if it's task or any other program we run. Uh, these kids deserve to get paid to be part of an internship. Now, at the university, we have a very vibrant internship program that we raise millions of dollars so that we can get the kids out there and be part of an internship that we are actually paying them from. So, uh, I, you know, going forward, I mean, I, I want to make this a point that none of our students should be out there in the workforce as an internship participant without getting paid, whether it's through the employer or through top public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I think right now, and any other questions? Uh, Ms. Daugherty um, has presented a motion, and uh, if you're ready to uh, state your motion, or if you want to just refer uh, to yeah, your written I, statement, I just, that's um, fine. I, I, I putting the fine point on the internships, of, uh, just because it ne paid internships it's never been done before doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, and that is why we are looking for tasks to sit down with the superintendent and or his designee to hammer out what the scope of service looks like in this new age post pandemic um, with the movement forward to create those internships that are paid whether the payment comes from here or the payment comes from the company we don't know I don't know whether or whether task negotiates with some of these business partners um, or not around paid internships so that's something that's going to that's going to go forward hopefully so we'll have more information on that thank you very much so motion is before the body do I hear a second second and we have a motion on the floor in a second to recommend to the school committee that the hundred and twenty five thousand be appropriated for the implementation of the Taunton Area School to Career Program for FY22 as follows. One, Taunton Public Schools will identify a responsible person to work with Taunton Area School to Career during the program implementation. Hold them accountable for the program deliverables and routinely report to the superintendent and school committee regarding the progress and effectiveness of the program. Two, Taunton Area School to Careers will work with the Taunton Public Schools to develop an agreed upon scope of services. Three, to explore the feasibility of paid internships which will be supported by utilizing up to 25,000 of the appropriation from of the program <coughs> on the motion any questions Ms. mrs delmeda well do you think before we vote on this we should have the answers that are necessary whether or not the students are going to be paid it's the the, the term the is ex to explore i mean and I, I think that that covers it to explore what? The feasibility of paid internships. That's part of the motion. Mm, I can go on. Okay. Uh, on the motion, uh, Mrs. Fagan and Mr. Polowski. Well, we got the minutes right here, and the woman that came here and talked about that. I'm respectfully asking the school committee to reconsider funding the task program for fiscal year 22 if for example we will level funded from the FY20 at the amount of 125,000 this would allow us to bring back two additional staff members and ultimately meet the needs of the students in Taunton as they emerge uh, from the pande mm -hmm. pandemic it will, it will allow us to go back to working with the teachers and directors who are already requesting our services and you know they're going with the mission of bridging business and education so they're going to take some of that money and bring back i mean you haven't eliminated that from this right um, well they're, they're saying they want to bring bring back two additional staff members I, I, I that suppose. was that was part of the conversation that we uh would but is that discussion? what would happen with this money no but we well, how, how do you that's what it says in here though but okay. that's the re, that's the public input of the person that presented. I understand that that's that's so what, this the, the subcommittee the subcommittee report the subcommittee motion is to there's to Taunton Public Schools will have a scope of services agreement with the um, Taunton area but school you, of career but you don't so they, have it yet though right no but they, that's well that's just it I see what Mrs. Almeida said. it doesn't necessarily they don't mean know what that is because initially they wanted to use some of that money to fund 
some of the members of the subcommittee want to talk about talk about so we'll go to mr Pulaski, then then uh, ms doherty yeah thank you what what we are proposing is that we include task in our work going forward that the work may look different than it has in the past and that is the reason why we are asking the superintendent to sit down with task to d to develop a scope of services that we feel is most uh, connected to the work that we need to do and we'll see what happens and we can't can't go forward with that conversation unless there are resources to support that if the scope of services discussion doesn't support what the superintendent is putting forward in terms of the relationship with task then that's that yeah mr. Pulaski then mr. DeMello uh, yeah, so sorry, uh, just not to belabor the point on uh, paid internships, but it, it's really not a difficult thing to find employers that will pay high school students for an internship. Um, company I worked for a couple of years ago, we did just that. We worked it out with a local vocational technical high school. The company itself creates the job description. You, you, find, you find a high school intern, the company pays them. So I, I would agree that we shouldn't need to pay the students for the work that they're doing. The point of having somebody running a program like this is that they would facilitate that stuff. You know, so if they're not directly negotiating on the student's behalf, which they probably would be since they're high school students, uh, they would be mentoring and coaching these kids, teaching them how to build resumes, go on job interviews, all of that. And that's all part of the educational experience. But I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's not difficult. Like if we place these kids in a position, that company, whomever's getting the services would, would pay for them. So that's the kind of oversight that we would need uh, to control this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I did uh, miss Doherty uh, with what she just said, but I just want to emphasize that I don't want to waste the superintendent's time to develop a scope of services with task, come back to us, and then we take a vote because we are now in June and we want to get this in by September, I believe, right, school year. And I don't want to waste the superintendent's time once again to develop scopes of services without a anticipation of having this go forward. And I have full confidence in the superintendent that if it's not going to meet all of our demands that we're talking about today, he's going to pull the plug and come back to us and say, folks, we can do it differently. So I think we're just here to move forward we don't meet until july what 14th i believe and then after that is august and then we're back in september so i think we should give this a consideration to go forward and rely on the superintendent to make the right decision thank you i'm going to close debate and call for the motion all those in favor aye aye, aye. opposed opposed that's uh, six to two wendy That concludes subcommittee reports under new business, uh, August 4th, 2021. Uh, we have the superintendent, uh, uh, we put in their bills only. That's probably not going to happen. We have to work on that. But what's going to happen, at least on that meeting, is we're preliminarily, preliminarily scheduling a, bud, a um, school committee workshop with Dr. Bent again for that night here. So could everyone put that on their calendar? Is the August the 4th? Is there any possibility of joining remotely? I'll be on vacation. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. And um, so I just want to also, while we're on the new business, it's not really not, I could go to old business, but I'll put it on the new business. I just remind the, my colleagues, July 14th and August the 11th, the school committee meetings July 14th, August 11th. It's in the bottom of the, of the packet. Moving on to unfinished business action items. Uh, I have a couple of updates on the action items. Superintendent <coughs> has been working on these. So number one, on the uh, administrative review of the policies, need updating the policy manuals. That's uh, Jim Hardy. At, uh, Jim Hardy has said he has done review, he'll be done reviewing the policy manual by 625. So we have some serious progress on that I'm sure it's going to go to rules after that so uh, I just wanted to give you an update on that and then finally the bottom one the dedication of the o Oakland complex to former mayor Johnson 
We are, in the, we are finalizing the engraving to, the de to dedicate the Oakland complex to meet uh, Mayor Johnson by the end of the month. And we are tentatively scheduling a dedication to take place on Thursday, September 23rd at 11 o'clock or rain date Friday, September 24th at 11 o'clock. September 23rd or September 24th, but the, the date is Thursday, September 23rd, 11 o'clock. The rain date is the Friday. That's a Thursday. All right. And then, um, oh, by the way, on the August the 4th, uh, Wendy will be in touch as far as um, once we can. Uh, we sent Dr. Bent, we're almost confirmed for him to be there on the 4th of August. So, but Wendy will finalize that with you. Mr. Martin. Uh, the new business, what about a uh, bills only beginning of July? No, we have the one meeting and that'll be fine. The deal will be. Fine with the city hall? Yeah, the July 14th. To go from the 16th yeah. of June to Mr. The we've, I've already squared it away with the superintendent. That's what we discussed. We, when we made the when we made this agenda, the superintendent me. said this would work. All right, moving along. Action items. Any questions on the action items, Mrs. Fagan? No, I, I, I wanted to go back. You blew right through new business. I I just have a quick question. Yes, go ahead. New business. Well, I don't know if it's new business. We we all got one of these from you. <laughs> yes, I I wasn't going to talk about what was in it, Mr. Cabral. I just want to know if if I've have got people asking me about what's going to happen at the high school. Contact the, uh, Excuse me? Okay. Can you contact the okay, it's fine. Uh, next item is the uh, executive session, and the chair will entertain a motion, uh, to motion to go into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining with the Titan Education Association pursuant to Exemption 3, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 20A3, and to reconvene in open session. Do I hear a motion? So motion made in? Do I hear a second? Yes. Motion made and seconded uh, to go into executive session. Mrs. Fagan, please call the roll. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Pawlowski? Yes. Mr. Fiore? Present, and I won't attend the session. Okay. Mrs. Fagan votes yes. Mr. Martin? Uh, present, and I will not attend the session. Okay. Mrs. Almeida? <coughs> Mr. DeMello? Yes. And Mr. Souza? Yes. We are in executive session and we will be reconvening an open session. Thank you. The uh, school committee will come back to order. Um, the chair will entertain a motion to come out of executive session. Second. Motion made and seconded. Mrs. Fagan, please call the roll. Mr. Starry? Yes. Mr. Pawlowski? Yes. 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 There was one motion made in the executive session, and we are going to make it an open session. Mrs. Almeida. Memorandum of agreement. Seconded by Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Doherty. Ms. Doherty. Uh, Mrs. Fagan, please call the roll. Yes. 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 Moving on, press time. The chair will entertain a motion for adjourn to adjourn. Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Good job, everyone.